at some point or the other, you or someone you know would have advertised somewhere that you have been hacked. With the advent of internet and its applications, security in this huge network became a major issue. Unlike other technology, the internet stakeholders are not only businesses and agencies, but also the general public. Hackers try to exploit vulnerabilities that stem from either human or system error for their advantage. But not all hacking is bad. With great power comes great responsibility. And that's the philosophy ethical hackers follow. But what does it mean to get involved in white hat hacking? Before we dive into that, don't forget to subscribe to the Great Learning channel and hit the bell icon to get notifications. My name is Ritika and this is Ethical Hacking Explained. At some point or the other, you or someone you know would have advertised somewhere that you have been hacked and any action that is being performed through the account is not actually you or this person. It's become a common enough word because it has become a common enough problem. Pop culture and media has portrayed hackers to be loners in hoodies typing away furiously on a black screen with green characters but the reality is so far from this imagery it could be just a jealous ex or a disgruntled employee with some knowledge of an app's code or structure to solve the problem of these cyber security issues organizations adopt a simple attitude it takes one to no one if an organization wants its infrastructure and services to be secure any cyber security expert would suggest to put it to the test against hackers to test them by attacking them this process is famously known as penetration testing whose main objective is to find vulnerabilities and fix them before malicious hackers can exploit them penetration testing is only one method of ethical hacking and every such tester knows various security analysis tools must be used throughout the entire software development phase Ethical hackers check for key vulnerabilities in parts of the system like authentication protocols, possible access points, data sharing protocols and other more complicated metrics that could expose a company to possible attacks. To be a hacker, one must have a sense of mischief. But what differentiate white hat hackers from black hat hackers are motivation and consequently consent. White hat hackers must be able to think like their black hat counterparts much like policemen need to be able to think like criminals that they apprehend many companies understand this and try to use it to their benefit google often holds hacking competitions as part of its process to find vulnerabilities in their products and offers large sums of money and job opportunities even to those who succeed to find their faults Many such tech giants sometimes openly challenge programmers to find weaknesses in their code and if they do they are compensated. This allows for a different breed of hackers to spring up, gray hat hackers. Contrasting white hat hackers, gray hat hackers don't have consent or don't ask for permission to penetrate systems and networks. But gray hats are also different from black hats in that their motivation is not malicious but rather for fun and usually inform the owner about any threats that they find. But this is still considered illegal by most but it depends on the institution at times. You could say that it falls in the gray area. Cybersecurity is a world that will go on as long as there's someone to exploit the opportunities they find for their own selfish malevolent purposes. At this point, the good guys are outnumbered. So if you're considering learning how to hack ethically and help organizations, you're on the right path. Don't forget to give it a thumbs up, share it with anyone you think might like it, and comment down below what you'd like to see next. For more videos like this, subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon to get a notification when we upload new videos. Remember, the only learning that matters is great learning. We start again so on authentication part so as i said authentication is about proving a person who you are claiming to be if that is what is authentication uh, as when you while you are learning you have to think about beyond that so think that okay if i have an organization i have an employee joining in if i am the cyber security officer and he is asking access to applications so how do i provide so what is the cyber security role in that you have to ensure right person is only having access to the right application that he intended to access if that is the case then you have to think about if there are more than one application do i have to give him password user id and password for each of those applications so what will be the practical problem will happen right 
So if you have five applications and you have five different user IDs and passwords, invariably either the resource will forget the passwords and you will start getting too many password requests and you have to handle that as part of operations role. And also when you are trying to, as user is need to now remember more than one password, he might write down the password somewhere. That can be what hacker can use to attack your organization. So you can think of concepts like single sign on. That is what the real world right now is trying to use to authenticate things. That what is a single sign on? It is an application that can be used to access multiple resources from one single source of truth. Generally in the industry, the single source of truth is Active Directory. What is Active Directory? Your Windows Active Directory where you can log into your laptop and access. Uh, so as you join to the organization, that is the first user ID you would get, right? So Active Directory. And also you can think, okay, if one user ID password, will that be enough? For example, now you can see that while accessing Gmail accounts, uh, it will ask for an additional password or additional uh, one-time code while you are trying to use it. You can also see the same thing will happen when you are using your internet banking. So you are already logged into your internet banking using your user ID and password. So you are already authenticating yourself who you are. So why are they trying to give you one more additional ID or one more one-time password or one-time uh, pin members why are they being generated it is called multi-factor authentication what does that mean that one id password may not be enough because someone might have guessed your password so but they will not be able to guess your one-time password so those are the additional things or additional layers of security that is coming in in the industry right now when you think of authentication perspective you should also start thinking when you are learning something, right? How does this apply? Okay, great. My application, if it is trying to be used from an insider, that is one of my employees, I might have ID password. But think of scenarios, right? In real world, how business would conduct. For example, you would have to deal with a lot of vendors. Uh, like, for example, your organization wants to purchase, let's say, 100 laptops. So you want different codes. Uh, from IBM, HP, different code, different vendors that are out there. If that is the case, if they want to come and submit the code in the website, how do they going to authenticate? How am I going to give them ID password, right? So those are the things you have to think. So where those are the cases right now, we give self-registration. So people can come, register their ID password, and then access the resources they would like to resource so that I don't have to generate a user ID password internally for all the vendors. That will be a tedious task to manage, right? So that is the thing you can think of as authentication. Now think, okay, the user is identified. He got in, great. Now what is it he supposed to access, right? This is again a very, very uh, important subject to understand when you are trying to use authorizations, right? For example, you are going to, okay, the previous example we took, Gmail. Okay, I put in my user ID password. Gmail sent me a one-time password. I have put that also in and now I entered. So what am I going to access? Various resources I will have. For example, I can access my mail, my calendar, my Google Drive. Similarly, in the organization, you will have an application. Let's say an ERP application. So an ERP application means ERP stands for Enterprise Resource Planning. So this is a software where you can do entire operations of your organization in that software. Example would be SAP or Salesforce. So these are the enterprise-wide applications that can be used. So various departments will use these applications. Say example, finance, HR, security people, database administrators, operating system administrators, uh, you can think of sales teams, finance teams, HR teams. So any department, all departments are trying to access their application, right? So why is authorization, what is authorization is basically trying to do? It is letting you access what you are supposed to access. So how it can become complex. So as a security person, you should ensure at a bare minimum to put it very simple, right? A HR data 
should not be accessed by a salesperson or a salesperson data should not be accessed by a administrator that kind of a segregation needs to be built in okay that is one layer now think of more in depth how does this authorizations work right let's say what is a hr's job is to increase let's say everybody's salaries that is a one of the role of a hr now imagine if you don't provide access properly if this person can go and increase salary for himself or herself that can be very dangerous for the organization isn't it uh, so you should be able to put authorizations in such a way this person this hr can have access to increase everybody's salaries because that is his role except his own that is what you can do that is what authorization is all about so what we learned is two parts authentication and authorization so what does authentication mean proving who you are to be and we have already learned that in authentication there can be multi factor authentications as well authorizations you have to ensure that a person is having access to resources what he or she is claiming or need to have only so you can think of scenarios like segregation of duties like segregation of duties between hr marketing administration as such so that's the authentication and authorization moving on to the next slide we have to ensure confidentiality now what is confidentiality in the previous example what we took right uh, hr salaries so you don't want your salary to be known to everybody in the organization you can think that okay display is a very simple access create change and delete are very critical access thinking that let's say you defined your authorizations in such a way display is possible anything you can display easily if that is the case and the salaries of every employee is available to everybody it can cause a havoc also think like your confidential information like aadhar card your aadhar card numbers passport numbers pan card numbers are available to everybody then what can happen you can think as a security officer right what kind of secret questions your credit card numbers will have your mother's maiden name your date of birth your first name last name your home address half of this information you give to the credit card uh, team they will reset your pin isn't it so that is what is a confidentiality is about you should protect that sort of a technical or important information for the organization it should not be available to everybody for example let's say you work in the company like coke or pepsi the formula to make coke can be the most confidential information that is available so as a cyber security officer how are you going to protect that confidential information or let's say you are working in a retail space for example you are working for an organization uh, like uh, levis or you are working for uh, an organization like abercrombie so these are all retail merchants like m&s where you will have lot of customers coming in trusting you swiping their credit cards and purchasing so as a company as a security you are supposed to keep that information confidential you are not going to put some security weak security around it so that hackers can come and have access to such confidential information that is all about confidentiality now comes to accountability what is accountability it means that every individual who works with the system should have specific responsibilities so that he is supposed to protect the information that he is having access to for example if you are working on a for a company or a large company that is going to acquire one more company and you are working on the deal so you know what is your code or you know that this having this information ahead to your any of your competitors they can cross bid more than the bid that you are trying to prove so what kind of an accountability you can put on that person to the access he have for example if 1000 people have access to that confidential code you will not be able to put accountability on a person who has leaked that information but if i give access 
to that kind of a confidential information only to you and tomorrow that information is leaked then you become accountable for example what is company is giving you is a email id and password company's email id and password to you any email that is going out of your inbox you become accountable for it you cannot say that oh i have shared my password with one more user because of an urgent requirement no the company has trusted you and gave you his user id and password so you become accountable for any action that happens so as a cyber security we bring in three impact important aspects to any data that is confidentiality integrity and availability we call it cia triad so what is confidentiality the in important information is only available to the required resource for the job legitimate job purpose what is integrity integrity is to ensure a person who is having access is actually accountable and no one else can claim or modify that data without having a proper authorization in place what is availability availability is an information available for business to make a right business decision whenever there is a legitimate business purpose required so whenever you go through any online resources you talk about you try to type in what is cyber security this is three word letter words that you see confidentiality integrity availability so how do we remember it is we call it cia triad okay so that is about the definitions of the basics of cyber security moving on to the next slide so what is the other important aspect as i told in the in the integrity piece right you should be able to prove that any transaction that is happened has happened from that person only and he will not be able to say oh i was not the person that is requested so the example that we try to give here is bank transfer let's say that you have requested the bank to transfer an x amount to a person b and bank has transferred that amount after the transaction has occurred if you are going to the bank and raising a dispute saying that oh i was not the person who was actually requested for it then bank should be able to prove oh sorry we have all the proofs to say that you are the person who has requested to move this amount of transfer to do that what bank is doing it is verifying that the user id and password that is submitted is unique to you so nobody else knows the user id and password and it also ensures there is a unique one time password that is can be sent only to you and readable only to you so that you will not be able to claim i am not the person who has requested for this transfer so the technical term we use for this is called non repudiation that means a person cannot deny the authenticity of the transaction the person has made as a security person you have to ensure this is possible so there are no common sharing of passwords so that the authentication is always proved so just to question any again on the topic that we have learned can any one of you say what is a denial of service attack means you can type in the chat any one of you are aware what is a denial of service means crashing the server okay anybody else shutting down the service so it's unavailable to users okay that's a great answer denying someone access to a service by either compromising the server or users great so yes these are some of the right answers right so basically a service is supposed to be available to the legitimate users so what is the denial of that is if i am a legitimate user i am trying to access a service and i am not getting it for example how can you think a denial of service attack can happen on a active directory server as i said authentication right if you are trying to put your user id and password and you have a right id and correct password and you are supposed to get access 
to your email but i am no i am a person i don't know anybody's user id i don't know anybody's password but i keep trying let's say 1000 times 10000 times wrong ids and wrong passwords the server will become busy in responding to me saying that hey your user id password is incorrect your user id password is incorrect so what would happen in that case the legitimate person who is trying to get in with his correct id password may not get a response or the server might become slow right so that is where a denial of service can attack can happen on an authentication perspective so moving on to the next slide just to complex the thing a little bit more how many of you are aware what is a distributed denial of service ddos attack so can someone put in their things what is the difference between dos and ddos denial of service versus distributed denial of service just give another 30 seconds for people to respond okay so what is yes so basically if you are a cyber security officer on organization and you are looking at a dos attack happening on the organization from a particular ip address so what would you do you would immediately try to block the ip from the firewall so that no network traffic coming from that particular ip address can be entered inside but think of this scenario that a person can an attacker have 1000 machines sitting across the world and trying to flood your network or the server from various points of attack it will be very difficult for you to block all these ips because you do not know what is the legitimate traffic coming in and what is the illegitimate traffic that is coming in so that is the case where you will not be able to block a particular attack because you do not know where is the origin of the attack that is called distributed denial of service so each of those machines that are causing this attack that is been commanded by the attacker we call them bots or zombies because they are under the control of the attacker so that is the distributed denial of service so we have learned till now again authentications authorizations confidentiality integrity availability and non repudiation moving on to the next slide okay so if we need to design a secure system what do we need to do the first thing we need to do is we need to understand what are the threats that exist to a system we call that as threat modeling right so what are the what is the difference between a threat and a vulnerability so we need to understand what is a threat first okay so what is a threat so you have to understand any type of threats are always not external so the basic thing that you remember the first word i say threat you will think of is an attacker an attacker always need not to be an outsider to an organization so this is very very important as a cyber security officer when you are designing systems when you are designing policies you should keep in mind this an attacker can be inside as well we call them insider threats so always do not think that a threat need to be external it can be internal it can be non intentional for example you think that okay for my system external attacker is very uh, evident so let me put a firewall in place so let's say you have a great firewall and then we thought okay let me put additional layer of security by putting a intrusion detection system ids okay great but i am an insider and i do not know much about security because let's say i am a finance person so what is my role my role is to do accounts for the organization and what do i do as a 
for my job living is only finance i have no, i have no clue about security virus or anything and i just bring in one of my usb sticks and plug into an organization laptop and connect it and if that usb stick have virus or a malware it can automatically spread over the network and my firewall cannot stop it because firewall only stops that is coming from an external so any traffic coming via network now an unaware internal employee clicking on a malicious link that came over an email we call that phishing or social engineering attack or an usb attack then that will not be stopped so you have to ensure as a cyber security officer when you are threat modeling to think of both internal attacks and external attacks as well so one of the things very important in cyber security is to understand what is a social engineering attack how many of you received on your personal email ids that you have received so much big amount in your lottery and please submit these details so that we can we can put money into your account or you would have received an sms saying that oh your number is selected for lottery most of us would have received unless you are on a do not disturb list right so basically what this mean is people would try to send an email to you to look at its real and try to make it interesting for you to download an attachment or a link for example right and you think this might be simple but trust me this is one in my since our last 13 years of my engagement uh, in cyber security this is one thing we are still struggling to deal with people raising people's awareness about phishing attacks because in a real world you will get hundreds of emails every day and you are expected to open the attachments to read through that right so what people can do they can embed a link look it like very real and they send it across to you and you click on the link to see what it is and the virus is downloaded or you open an attachment a virus is downloaded so this is very very important for you to understand just like how we have dos and ddos we also have phishing and spearhead phishing so the difference is spearhead phishing is you are targeting a particular person because you have done already a profiling on them so how does profiling works to give you a real world perspective what's happening right so for example they'll go to linkedin profiles they try to see which organization are you working for what is your background so let's say they see you as an accountant person right so you deal with vendor bank accounts so they try to see what is your email and then they try to see go to your facebook try to see what what information you have so whom are you interacting with what kind of vendors you interact with they try to obtain even nowadays people post lot of things on their resumes so they try to go to naukri or any of these websites to see what projects you have worked on which clients or vendors you are dealing with once they have obtained that information they can send a message targeted at you that may look very very real because they know what who you are what projects you have worked on what kind of information it is available to you so that they can target and ensure you they will you click on the link or download an attachment for example if they know for example in facebook you posted that i am excited to travel to us next week you will get an email saying attached are the tickets you will think no i already have my tickets where is this tickets coming from and you can just click and open right so they play with human psychology there so these are called the various types of attacks so how do you prevent them awareness is what we need to bring in as cyber security team as cyber security officers it is not security is not only about dealing with technology it is dealing with people as well and understanding who can cause threat to the organization right so this is what we call threat modeling and also you need to think when you are doing threat modeling is how important this system or this application or this database to the business and how critical or confidential data this handles if i take another example if let's say your company have a website and that website currently talks about only what services your organization provides so if i think of a threat who can be threats to this anybody who want to defame my organization 
can hack this website and probably change the services that we provide or try to prove that my organization is not secure enough right if you think why cyber security can help business let's say you have choice to open bank account in two banks bank a or bank b bank a it been hacked let's say in last one year 10 times and people's credit card information pin numbers been stolen and people lost money and in bank b they never been hacked they never have they never had uh, like you know uh, they never had any information leakage so if you have a choice which bank do you open account with obviously with bank b because you want your information to be safe similarly all customers of your business will also have a choice of either dealing business with you or business with others so unless your business is proven resilient and secure you might lose customers the best example that you can think of is sony playstation attack lot of playstation users information confidential information has been leaked out they had to literally shut down many of their playstation games because of the attack that happened on them so similarly you have to think for your organization if an attack happens what would be the consequences so that will help you do threat modeling so as i said if that your website is currently only hosting about your services the attackers might be your competitors but no financial attacker would come because there is no financial information available but let's say your company now thinks let me make sales online let's say that i am selling chairs as an organization let me go online and let people come and order chairs online with their credit card so the threats what you have in the previous case can go multifolded with the next case because now you have financial information out there on the because you become an e-commerce platform so this is what you have to think on threats and then you understand the coding the vulnerabilities so that you understand what risks exist to the organization what is a risk risk is a multiplication of a threat exploiting a vulnerability a probability of a threat exploiting a vulnerability will be equal to a risk so we will calculate risk as probability multiplied by impact so what is the probability probability of a threat exploiting a vulnerability so as a next step now understanding threats we need to move towards understanding vulnerabilities can we move on to the next slide please <clears throat> so if you need to understand vulnerabilities you need to understand how to design a safe system or a secure system right if you do not design a secure system you will bound to end up having vulnerabilities so let's try to understand what good looks like or how does safe system actually looks like right a safe system should be able to robustly and consistently do error handling for example if you have authentication as we gave an example right if you put user id and password and the password you the system is supposed to handle verify the combination of user id and password and give you a result whether you are the person who is expected or not so instead of giving a password and you thought like okay password needs to be you declared it as 16 character password but how do you handle the password is 1000 character length is someone entered because think of the coding right how you write a code the person will enter user id a person will enter a password then you have to parse each character in the password and then compare it against the database if you don't write your system error handling properly what can happen if it is a thousand character password someone enters it may be going into an infinite loop because it will consume all the memory space to check the password to verify the password and then it will system may crash down or you can think very simple right this is like little bit technical error think of a simple error right you are entering a user id password 
and you have a message when a password is wrong you're saying that instead of saying user id slash password is incorrect if you correctly say password is incorrect then what can happen I at least confirm user id is correct i can start playing around with password right so that as simple requirement to a complex re requirement like passing passwords you have to think how you can handle errors and exceptions properly share requirements with quality assurance team why is quality assurance team coming in the secure system because the security requirements has to be embedded from initiation phase of a project if i take a good example sorry yeah, yeah uh, if i take a good example if you are building a web server so you want to build http protocol or https protocol if you have written the entire coding on port 80 which is used for http and you finish the entire product and in the end as a security person you go to the developer and you say you know what you cannot use http because http will send user id password in a clear text format over the network so any hacker who have simple tools like wireshark who can put it on the network and monitor that network traffic can understand what is your user id and password so please change the coding to https now imagine how much that cost can happen because the security came in the later end of the cycle of the project so that is the reason they say secure by design so this is the cyber security word that has come after gdpr you would have heard that european has come up with a new regulation for protecting european citizen data called gdpr general data privacy regulations and they used the word called secure by design so what does it mean you should embed security while designing a product itself so what happens anyone who is aware of software development life cycle can can you answer this question when do you develop user acceptance test scripts anyone who worked on development when do you develop a user uat test scripts in the end okay anybody else in the beginning okay that's a very conflicting answers between end and beginning interesting okay i'll repeat the question when do you develop user acceptance test scripts testing phase okay during design and requirement we confirm the test plan okay once development is completed interesting let's give few minutes for everybody to participate during technical design okay throughout it's a continuous thing okay that's an interesting answer okay so we have actually if you see the answers are varying from starting to the end to the continuous so let's try to understand that user acceptance test scripts are actually written at the time of the requirements gathering phase itself the reason being is the end user requirements as they capture that is what against which your development or system will be validated against so now the secure by design concept is ensuring that as part of requirements you capture the security requirements as well so that the security testing will become mandatory as part of uat passing because no system will be moving to production unless uat is passed so the quality assurance teams that are responsible 
for the execution of the testing results will ensure the security is tested as well so that the people who are designing who are embedding the requirements who are collecting the requirements and designing a product is forced to think about security to embed security and the answer for having a continuous is ensuring security is there in the each phase yes that is correct but the, for the question that i asked about when do you develop is when the requirements are gathered the the reason i asked this question is you need to remember to collect security requirements at the initial phase itself security is also as important as a functional requirement adding or trying to add security in the end will result in more costly uh, in terms of changing and also it will cause distress among business because by the time the functionality is ready business will be in a urge to go live and if they go live with vulnerabilities in place based on the threat modeling we learned on the previous phase can cause risks to the organization that is why they say share these requirements with qa team so they will ensure the minimal security standards that you have set is being what built in the system handle internal errors securely so any internal errors that are happening the exception handling has to happen clearly so what kind of an information that you provide as part of the exception has to be very minimal to the end user because the hackers will use these internal errors and try to either hack or take control of your code and use it for a malicious intents what is defensive programming use of defensive programming defensive programming is think through all the exceptions or errors that might occur and ensure those are being baked in for your programming but doing too much of this can also have a problem on using of system resources and the response times so there can be a trade off between security versus response times so you have to ensure that is been balanced appropriately that is why you have to understand what level of threats exist because if you try to go for a overkill you try to handle every exception scenario then the time it takes for the program execution might be more and it will have an effect on your uh, end uh, result on the customer who is trying to use the program the validations and fraud checks for example if you are trying to use credit card to make an online payment the pci dss payment card industry data security standards will say that you never should have stored the cvv numbers that in your database while processing the credit card payment that is the payment card industry standard says the reason being is the cvv number will be able to use to do the validation of the credit card if a hacker gets hold of a credit card number he will still not be able to get the hack of cvv numbers that's the reason they say never store cvv numbers even though you process the credit card payments against a person security or burst policy what does this mean this means that you are trying to educate your developers to do development in a very secure manner and security requirements are baked into their coding otherwise you are vulnerable for an attack so that is what they are calling it bust either you are secure or you are going to be busted if you are not developing the pro programs securely enough so just to recap this flow we have gone through we learned the basics of authentication authorization confidentiality integrity availability we understood what kind of threats exist and then we are trying to understand vulnerabilities as part of vulnerabilities we try to understand how does a secure system look like moving on to the next slide okay we have a question on cvv number gautam is there any audit that checks cvv number in the database which is intentionally storing the cvv numbers 
Yes. If see if any of the uh, PCI DSA standards, these are standards. These are not regulations. Okay. The since if you any organization who is trying to process credit card numbers, any e-commerce websites or any organizations that are collecting these credit card payment information, payment gateway information, if they are supposed to go through this PCI DSS audit. So any of these gateways you see, they will have a PCI DSS certified. They will put Verizon secured and PCI DSS certified. They will put that slide. If they want to put that standard, then they have to go through this audit and the PCI DSS team will do the audit to verify if they are storing the CVV information. If they are caught, they will be removed with the PCI DSS standard. Since it is not a regulation, you will not be able to punish them, but people will stop using their e-commerce websites if they don't see PCI certified. Because that is the industry standard out there. So what? So if you notice, I use two important words here. One is standard, one is regulation. Standard is what an industry standard is all about and against which you can get certified. A regulation is intended by the government. If you do not follow, then you can be penalized. For example, the biggest regulation that has come out in recent years is the GDPR, the European Citizen Data Protection Law. If your organization, if anyone uh, you know, puts a case on you against GDPR, and if, the, if that is proven, then you might be penalized up to 10% of your global revenue. So when we talk about passwords or any confidential information, basically what I'm trying to understand is what is the passwords, right? So the passwords are you are, you're probably mentioning is any confidential data. So there is two concepts called data in transit, data at rest. What is data in transit means is the data that is traversing over the network. So for example, your Gmail ID password. When you enter ID password from your web browser, it has to reach the Gmail server and then it will get processed. Through the network, from your home internet or home router, before it reaches the server, it will go through various ISPs, internet service providers, networking tunnels, right? So how do you ensure it is encrypted? That is why we use protocol called HTTPS. HTTPS will ensure the encryption happens. So people who are not aware what is an encryption, encryption is a way to convert a plain text into a cipher text which cannot be read by a person unless an intended person knows how to decipher the text and, and get the plain text out of the cipher text again. So as a web server or you are building a service, you should always in, in <clears throat> you should always ensure that any data that is traversing over the network, any confidential information you are trying to retrieve, you should use HTTPS for web service protocols. And this is about data in transit. I also use a word called data at rest. That is the password, right? You are not you, the password is not not only to you. The password is also stored in the server, correct? The password is stored in the server and let's say there is a malicious database administrator if who have access to that table, he takes out all those passwords and put it out there on the internet. If you remember about six months back, there was a huge outcry on all our LinkedIn ID passwords being leaked out. All our Yahoo mail ID passwords were leaked out. Even the Facebook ID passwords were leaked out. So this is what will happen if data at rest is not encrypted. So this is what is about data in transit and data at rest. <clears throat> so as I mentioned right now, few of the big names like Facebook, LinkedIn, emails, Gmail. So these are all like one of the big organizations and they are still susceptible to attack. How people are attacking these organizations, how people are getting the information, right? So let's try to understand various types of uh, attacks or various types of mechanisms via which they can attack. 
so the first thing we can understand is malware what is malware it is a shortcut for malicious software so it is nothing but a software which is being used in a malicious way right so anything that you can think of you can think of virus adware spyware ransomware whatever we declared here are all malicious softwares okay so these are all basically a still a software coding written by someone for a malicious intent okay so let's try to understand the difference between the virus and worms right so what is a virus what is a worm so basically to try to understand virus the definition of a simple virus is it is a virus that is used to ensure uh, a virus basically self replicates itself and propagates so what does this mean self replication itself let's say if there is a virus in your usb stick and you plug it into the laptop then it can replicate itself when you let's say you are trying to copy some file from usb to a to to your uh, computer it can attach itself to that document and come over to your laptop when the transfer happens or if you try to open an attachment right when you click on the link when you try to open an attachment then the virus that is attached can download along with the home page that or uh, whatever the web link that you try to open but if you notice all of these actions need a little bit of human interaction for example you plugging in the usb stick or you trying to download an attachment or you trying to download a software so virus needs a human interaction what is a worm a worm is again a self replication software but it can spread over the network itself so what does it mean let's say a worm sitting on your laptop you go and connect your laptop to your office wifi or an office lan then it can spread to all machines that are vulnerable for that particular worm and it can go and spread over the network itself you don't need to send a file to someone you don't need to send a link to someone it you just connect that laptop then it can spread over the network so that is why it is very important to understand that worm can spread much more faster than a virus okay so coming back to chat questions i see a chat saying how graphical database is attacked as facebook uses the graphical database yes you can understand that facebook uses a graphical database but they do have vulnerabilities especially when you are trying to use some of those uh, apps that come in along with facebook right you click on the facebook link and then there will be a usage of app that will come in and then you try to uh, it will try to judge you what is your age or it will try to generate a survey then people try to understand that and they will try to get uh, they will they will think that they are not giving away any information but then they will put a malicious software and they get it out of it and also you can still there are optical recognizers that are available that can read information out from a graphical user databases as well so yes the attackers are getting more and more sophisticated in terms of the available tools they have so let's try to understand little bit more different types of viruses that we have we have something called spyware so what does the spyware do it basically sits on your machine and it is undetectable because it won't encrypt your system or it will not uh, in it will not interact with you on any any way it will just sit there and try to listen into your conversations wait for you to type a credit card or wait wait for you to do a malicious transaction and then it will just take out that information and send it to hacker out there one of the best examples of this spyware attack is the recent whatsapp attack if you are aware about uh, one month back there was a major breach on the whatsapp uh, where one of these israel companies was able to come out with a vulnerability in whatsapp where they can initiate a phone call and the phone call you don't even need to answer the phone call 
but due to one of the vulnerabilities that we are going to learn on the buffer overflow they use that attack so that you will be able to they will be able to control your microphone and camera so it is as simple as that they can use it right then we have ransomware where people will encrypt like wanna cry attack that we thought of it was recent big cry where people you come into your laptop encrypt all your files and then say that you need to pay me so much amount only then i will release the uh, decryption key right that is the ransomware then we have adverts advertisements so they keep popping up generally these are nuisance they are not going to uh, cause harm to your computer but it will be like uh, anything you try to open the ads keep coming up and you need to keep closing them so it will it can become a trouble to you so we already thought of what is warm small waste trojans trojans are something that will try to appear as something but they actually do something in the background for example uh, most of these android games right uh, the difference between android games and apple is that android anybody can go and openly host your software without being validated uh, for the codes because it's an open source but in ios most of this code will be uh, verified by the apple before it's being hosted on the app store so what has happened is android become more susceptible because people will take most of these uh, famous games they try to put some malicious code in between in the code like collecting some of this data like the banking apps that you have or the uh, phone data that you have so especially when you try to download a particular app look at what it is trying to access and see why it needs a permission to access those and you have to see that you the source of the app you are trying to download is a genuine source or not those kind of things that you can do to ensure your mobiles are safe because the virus can attack your mobile as well right and nowadays the smartphones have more confidential information than before so they can use that for malicious intents so it is very important that this you are aware about this trojan viruses because it may look and work perfectly fine as a game but in the background it might be asking permission from photos permission to access your microphone you need to really be careful why is it needs a microphone access or a photos access if it is trying to download a trojan and you can also think many of the websites nowadays gives you option to log in with gmail or facebook so very be very very careful what is the permission they are trying to access because most of them very silently they will say they even though it is easy for you that you don't need to go and register yourself on that website you can use your google account but they will take access to all the contacts next time when some website is trying to ask you to let you log in with google just try to see whether they are uh, trying to ask you for the contacts if they want you to log into their website using google or gmail password why are they asking you for those contacts information in your gmail basically they are going to spam them to use your uh basically use your to use their service right so this is the kind of things you have to be careful and be aware as a cyber security student or a cyber security officer in future moving on to the next slide so let's try to understand a particular vulnerability this is called a buffer overflow vulnerability so before i want to go in depth to buffer overflow can you guys anyone who is gone through the course can you give me a quick brief what is a buffer overflow you can unmute yourself anyone who would like to give it give a try what is a buffer overflow okay shama reddy okay i think he just logged out anybody else want to give a try what is a buffer overflow who has gone through i mean like entering more data than what is required okay so that it will fill the entire memory of the server okay great that's a very quick uh, uh, very very uh, very quick for way of uh, putting that information anybody else would like to also give a try um buffer overflow uh, in which a function or any operation will uh, write more uh, information than the buffer size which may cause the side effect uh, can be intentionally used to run some piece of uh, function pointer perfect anyone else
writing bad recursive program also can end up in this buffer overflow okay so basically the yeah whatever the previous guy said that's correct so whatever the memory can handle putting more data or the it's kind of a deadlock kind of data input into the system so that memory will overflow and your program will crash in some point of time okay i think everybody try to uh, thank you so much guys for being participative it's very important to have this interaction so that we understand uh, that you know what you guys are following and what you where uh, so i can also put more emphasis on where we need to uh, focus so just to give you buffer overflow basically is a type of a vulnerability that is introduced into a software because of a bad coding practices if for example well, the morning example the one like a continuous example we've been taking is authentication if you have to write a piece of code or a piece of software to validate the user id or password and pass the user input that you receive from the user and then validate against it in the database and confirm whether it is a correct password or not right this is the how an intended software should work since the let's say organization standard is to use a 16 character or a 12 character password a software requirement guy has asked the administrator okay okay as part of requirements can you please tell me what is the length of the password would you like to have and uh, the system owner has said okay we prefer 16 character password so now the you, what the person who was writing the code has done is he declared the variable of the password to be 16 character length so how does a basic memory allocation work based on the programming is when it goes through the any program it's usually start with declaration of variables correct when the declaration of variable have a particular size it will allocate the memory size so in this case let's say it allocated the 16 character memory size now a user by mistake or with a malicious intent entered an 18 character password what will happen the first 16 characters will properly go and sit in the memory the 17th and 18th character will start spilling over to other parts because it has to collect the data so whatever that information that was there in that stack for recording other information may get overwritten or may get corrupted because the data is being flown into spaces where it is not intended to be so that is why we are calling it overflow buffer is nothing but you are keeping some reserved space when your reserved space is getting overflown we call it buffer overflow so it can be because of various reasons right so if you are familiar with c programming for example the get s function or scanf functions these are open for buffers so it will have it will not have a specific buffer sizes so what this would probably will cause is an unlimited buffer so it can consume the entire memory space that can be the opposite of the buffer flows right so it will it can also cause the program to cache for example if people are familiar with object oriented programming or function point programming you will have a main program and then you will have a class that will be written or a subroutine that will be executed then it has to return back to the main program to give you a think of a visual scenario you have step one step two step three and step three will call a sub function where the sub function has to come to finish the result has to pass to step four okay now how computer should remember is okay step one step two step three great whatever the data i have collected i should pass it on to the subroutine and when subroutine completes it should remember that it should come back to step four correct now imagine that while executing the subroutine 
a buffer overflow happened and the overflow happened to the place where the computer kept the information of where to come back then what will happen since the computer do not know what is the next thing to do it may either collapse or a hacker can use that particular moment of weakness from the computer to say okay you don't go to line number 4 go to line number 10 or go to my own subroutine that i have installed and start executing this so that can become a attack vector for a buffer overflow so think of this logically right so what do you want to do to defend this you want to ensure that a buffer when it is the declarations or the coding that you are trying to do for variables has to be securely written so that it can handle the exceptions correct it can just throw that hey you know what the, your input is more than 16 character so i will not be able to handle this request anymore so please enter a right password if that is what happens then we can avoid the buffer overflow right and also from a security point of view let's say that in case even though we have taken enough security mechanism still a hacker found a vulnerability then you would like to know if a buffer overflow attack happened so you want to stop executing that program immediately so that it cannot go damaged beyond that program so you want to contain the damage right so what you can do you can put a let's say a phrase in the stack right and when you are trying to come back and execute the next step you should verify if that phrase is gotten rewritten or not if that phrase is not rewritten then you know that okay great uh, the phrase is not rewritten so there is no buffer overflow attack if the phrase got if that particular phrase got rewritten then you know that buffer overflow attack happened so you want to stop executing the program immediately so this is one of the examples or one of the techniques they have given uh, in the course for you to see how the buffer flow over attack can be stopped so it is very important for you to understand two things when buffer overflow attack happens the user the attacker can hijack your program and run his own lines of code or he can direct so that the lines of code can go on to within the program by skipping whatever he wants to correct because the buffer overflow is happening on the memory let's say that the other way of stopping the buffer overflow for half of the problem is make memory read only so that attacker cannot write his own piece of code but he can still use it to bypass some of the lines of code and use your own program and bypass it for the checks for example user id password we have taken let's say i, I entered a 20 character password instead of 16 character password so if the program works fine it is supposed to verify the password and say okay the password is correct then go to step 6 which is entering you into the application so my password is incorrect by using this attack what i can do is i can go and direct the program go to step 6 without verifying whether it is correct or not so you have to think that scenario as well just by locking the memory and saying memory is cannot be uh, you know can be making read only can stop buffer overflow no buffer overflow attack can also happen by using your own lines of code against you okay that is the buffer overflow and the vulnerabilities in it moving on to the next step yeah this is what the example they try to give on what uh, we just explained so you have a main program where you have the variables and you have the stack declared with the stack pointer and if you see the line 2 uh, i mean the diagram 2 there is a return address where to go to the return address so if the return address is got overflown then they can point it to somewhere else where it is not intended to go on the line 3 right 
So this is a simple way of articulating how the buffer overflow looks. Moving on to the next slide. So before we go to the case studies, uh, I would like to understand uh, any other questions you have on the uh, on the chapters that you have read through or any questions you have on what you learned so far. You can put it on the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, Gautam, can we go back to the uh, last slide? Sure. Uh, Ravindra, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to understand more about this. So, for example, uh, written at in the second diagram B, yeah, uh, where function B will get invoked, and yeah. how is the exact sequence of things are happening here in this case? Sure. Uh, let Let me go back and explain again. Right. Um, so, think of this that there is a main program, okay, and you have the moment you declare variables you will have a virtual address space reserved for you in your memory. Okay. So here you can think of the variable is like a password character. Okay. 16 character password. So your routine is to go collect that password. Then verify the password can be your sub program. So think of this program that they are writing it as sub program and you will have that sub program to verify the password and give the result back to the main program. So the main program looking at the result, whether the password is correct or wrong, it can give you a particular page. For example, if it is correct, you will see the emails. If it is incorrect, you will get a message saying your password or email is incorrect. Okay. That is what your program is intended to do. Clear. Okay. So now the moment your password is declared, you will have a space reserved in the memory. Okay, that is what they are trying to show that you have a stack pointer and your local variables are declared. And when you have the written address, right? Once the local variables are there, and when the main program parsing through, okay, it has collected the password. Now it wants to call the sub program to verify the password. So when it is going to the sub routine, the memory should have a space to understand where it should return to. That is the return address in the stack. Okay. Now you have the return address also properly maintained. And now the return, now the while passing the password, let's say the buffer overflow happened. Okay. Now what happened on the section C, if you see, the local variables, the return address got overwritten because the overflow of the character length that is being used for the password happened. So now the program do not know what is the return address is. Okay. So either now at this point, what it can do, a hacker can point the return address to wherever he wants externally or internally in the program. So then the program, whatever the result, since the result could not be passed through, he can ensure that even though your password is incorrect or basically it couldn't validate your password because it have a 20 character password, but you have the memory space of 16 characters. So you will not be able to pass that password and understand whether it is right or wrong. So this routine is ideally should return you whether it is correct or wrong. And then based on that, you will go based on if else loop generally. Uh, if the password is correct, then open the emails. If else, just display this message. So they can point the pointer to come back to open the emails directly. So uh, now what will happen? Even though you didn't enter a right password, you will be going to the emails directly for that user ID. Is that clear? Okay. Yep. yep. Actually, uh, in terms of memory uh, arrangements, maybe it depends upon how stack is arranged and where it is growing towards or where the new variables are kept and how they are overwriting to the back address or something like that. Correct. Uh, basically, uh, the, the basic concept of buffer workflow for you, yeah, if you go deeper into a programming language, you will have different types of stacks. 
uh, first in first out last in first out there are various ways uh, a memory space can be used uh, but for 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 a cyber security team to understand or the buffer flow overflow attack can happen whenever there is a memory spillage happens and the return addresses get corrupted got it yeah Everything malicious in our context can be called malware. Yes, any malicious software can be called as a malware. I had posted questions on Piazza. Could you please answer them for me? Uh, Raghavendra, can uh, you help me with that? Uh, hey, uh, Gautam, I'll just post it here again if you would like to. Or... Yes, please. Sure. So I had two questions currently. Sure. As I have gone through the session, the protection against core security is given more importance. How important is core security when compared to network security? See, there is no difference, or uh, or there is a various varying levels of uh, security because everything is important. Uh, so right now, the importance of this portion is given, or this uh, first course is given on the secure coding. But network security is equally important as as much as the coding security, because uh, it also depends on uh, the the type of uh, application that you are trying to develop, right? Uh, what kind of an application it is, what kind of an information it is having. Network security will become more and more important uh, if you it is exposed over the internet, because uh, the system has should have the capacity to uh, traverse. Over the network, the data travels over the network and get the information as well. So yeah, if you got, what is more important, there is nothing. Uh, all layers of security is important, right? So from an application layer to the transport layer and data physical layer as well. To that level, all seven layers of security is equally important. Okay, so uh, my concern is, so I've been working into networking from last three to four years. So if I have to understand the code security, then I have to go through all the coding sessions as well. So probably, you know. Yes, uh, it becomes increasingly important uh, to become a complete cybersecurity professional uh, to have a, a coding bag, a coding knowledge as well. It, it is really important because, uh, so as you've been working as a network security professional, right? So you understand that, um, there is a difference. Uh, there's already a network security engineer available, like yeah. uh, with CCNA certificate or uh, Juniper certified uh, consultants who are available. But there is also a cyber security consultant available in the organization. So what is the difference is they look at the things holistically. So okay. there will be an application security guy who will look into it. There will be an accurate it's a network security guy. There will be an enterprise architecture team. But the cyber security consultant should have the capacity to look at uh, holistically from end to end. And uh, especially uh, nowadays, VAPT uh, penetration testing, uh, you know, will become is becoming uh, more and more important. So it is becoming important for people to understand uh, scripting knowledge. Uh, and uh, one of the leading uh, scriptings that are being used are Java scripting and Python. Yeah, yeah. These these uh, so having at least, a, if not to a capacity to write. Uh, a capacity to understand the coding is very important. Okay. So you should be able to read through the code and see what is available out there. And uh, practically, at the industry level, uh, like uh, for example, do I sit in my role and read through every piece of code? No. We have tools available, uh, like uh, Coverity is one of the tools. C O V E R I T Y. Coverity. This is one of the tool that is being used to scan through the codes for the vulnerabilities. And you have tools like Sonar Cube, so mm -hmm. there are there are tools that will go through the code and give you the vulnerabilities list. So you should have the capability to understand what is it that's been driven, because if it says it's a it's susceptible to a buffer overflow, you should be able to at least go and see and see what kind of uh, uh, you know uh, the declarations being made. So to that capacity, you should be able to understand. But uh, is industry expecting you to write uh, pen testing code? No. Okay. Having that knowledge of understanding the code is sufficient. Yeah. So I was a little worried about that. So how, how is this is divided into, you know, network security and code security and how important is code security rather than network security? 
<laughs> there are further modules that will come on network security as well. Uh, yeah. Cryptography, network security. There, it's going to cover the holistic approach. Cool. Yeah, that's that's that answers. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, the second question we have is it will help to uh, apply patches and deciding severity of the patches and distributed by the software vendors. Yes, patching is important as well. Uh, but uh, patching will be coming for the uh, softwares that you are acquiring, for example, Windows or SAP. But what about the custom applications that you are developing internally from ground up? So those are the applications that are also uh, developed by organizations, right? So those are the cases where uh, you will be more uh, focused on looking at these kind of vulnerabilities and using these tools uh, to scan them and ensure that, uh, you know, any vulnerabilities that are coming out being addressed. Cool. Uh, so that is what uh, we have learned uh, today. And let's move on to the uh, uh, let's move on to the next slide uh, for the case studies. And I'm really uh, sorry. For the, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Gautam, Gautam Raghavendra here. Yeah. So I don't have the presentation where you have modified the case studies. Yeah, th that's fine. Now let's let's discuss the one. I uh, let's let's move to that. Okay. So uh, most of the people who are working, especially in the network background, would have heard about this attack, right? One cry attack. So what happened? This is basically a ransomware. It spreads over the network. It encrypts anything that it sees on the way, and then it will ask you. It will ask you for money to pay when it is uh, uh, when, when they want to uh, give you a uh, decryption key. So basically, to understand this more, let's try to understand what is encryption and decryption a little bit. Uh, in depth, we can go through when we go over the cryptography, right? So encryption is a way for you to ensure a plain text is converted into a cipher text. So that means you need a key and an algorithm. So for example, if ABCD is a plain text, you have an algorithm to replace each English character with the next character. So a plain text of ABCD can become BCDE. So that is the, what is the algorithm? Algorithm is to replace it with another letter. The key is one letter. So then the plain text of ABCD will become BCDE. If the keys become two letter, then the plain text of ABCD will become CDEF. So algorithm remained same. The key was changing. You understand? So this is the basic way of encrypting a message. To decrypt, you need to know the key so that you will be able to decrypt and get the plain text of ABCD back again from a character length of BCDE, right? So this is being used basically in the war times so that the message is secretly sent to the battlefield. And there were various two techniques of encryption that's being used and various keys like a symmetric key and a symmetric key encryption being used. Just to give you a background, what is a symmetric key? What is an asymmetric key? If the same key is used to encrypt and decrypt, it is called symmetric key encryption. If a different key is used for encrypt and decrypt, then it is called a asymmetric key encryption. Okay. So this virus, they found a way in Windows operating systems to enter and encrypt all the data that is available and then ask for money. The interesting factor people started noting about Bitcoins is only after this. So just to give you again a very brief about what is a Bitcoin, right? It is a cryptocurrency. So what is a currency? Just to give you a, right? Uh, if you take any note, a 100 rupee note or 200 rupee note, it is being built or it is being given by a government, right? Uh, in our case, it is given by RBI. And it will say a wording in that note saying the bearer of this note will be paid so and so amount and a reserve bank of Ghana signs that note, then it becomes a valid note, right? That is a currency. So what actually it means for you in case if you're not aware about any financial institution is you can go 
to a reserve bank of india and give this 200 rupee note and get a equivalent worth of gold so because gold was used as a currency so if you remember uh, in 1990s we pledged our gold and uh, at pv nasimha rao time and then we got money back uh, to print right otherwise every every government can print whatever the amount of notes they need right so that is basically you are giving an authenticity to a piece of paper so cryptocurrency nakatomo has come up with a very interesting concept where you do not need any banking institution everybody who is on the part of the network can validate or authenticity of that coin and then you can use that as in terms of replacement for a currency okay so people started accepting this bitcoins because like paytm wallet where you can store money there are wallets that have come up where you can store bitcoins in an encrypted format so you do not have to declare to whom that money is going so that is the reason why people started collecting money from bitcoins because otherwise you need a bank account and the money has to be deposited there and then people will try to trace those bank accounts and try to find it you know so that is why now all the uh, cyber world you know the black cyber world is trying to use cryptocurrencies so moving on to the next slide let's try to understand how this wanna cry attack actually uh, hacked and what are the steps that been used in this attack so you can look at this how and actually the screen would look when the encryption happens you will not be able to do anything you just will get a message like this it will look like this and you have to make a payment again as this and only when you make a payment you will get a decryption key and then your system is open and if you think only normal organizations would got attacked with this no all big multinational organizations were attacked too and uh, you can think of uh, one of the major organization that was attacked was the pharmaceutical industry merck they have been attacked and there was a 300 million dollar damage happened because all their servers were attacked as well because this is a kind of a worm that spreads over network right so what happens is if you have a flat network that is in your organization you can do a network segmentation like i can have all my servers in a particular running on a particular network all my end users coming in from a particular country can be in a particular network but if i do not have network segmentations and if i have a flat network and one end user computer got encrypted then it can spread quickly over to all the servers if they are on the same network segmentation so some of these organizations who are not tech savvy because their primary uh, primary focus on the business is on pharmaceutical or on transport and logistics companies uh, so they were all got attacked because they were running on a flat networks uh, moving on to the next slide where we will try to show you more detail so the first step they try to use uh, that they, they try to use the tcp port 445 uh, on which the network targeting was happening so that the moment 445 is used then you know that they are using smb connections and the moment they know smb they will initiate the smb v version 1 connection and then the buffer overflow is used because there was a windows in the windows coding the smb connections had a buffer overflow issue the moment the buffer overflow happens they have converted that memory corrupted the memory and executed their own code that is used to encrypt the system files uh okay and once this happened what was happening was it quickly spreads over to the over the other networks how it opens is the the connections that was used the the once the one system is compromised they can use that to ensure that you know uh, it is used to have uh, it used to spread over using this as a attack vector because now once you are inside the network it is easy for you to spread over and i see one of the chat question that said what is a smb connection 
the smb convention is basically the server message block protocol it is basically used to do a network file sharing it is in microsoft windows especially and uh, it is like a very common and interface you know internet file systems right so it is used to share the files and uh, they use this so that tcp is like uh, it's a protocol used for transfer control protocol and uh, this had that issue of uh, buffer overflow when they are written how the file exchange should happen and while the file servers are being stored in the memory the buffer overflow will happen and the files will get encrypted because uh, they will corrupt the memory and execute their own lines of code okay so this is one of the case studies we would like you to discuss and uh, the next case study i want to discuss unfortunately not on the slide but let me try to explain you uh, it is the uh, new attack that has come up just on the last week okay so this is called brute force attack so what is a brute force attack basically trying to guess your id and password with the various combination passwords that's been used because many of the passwords that's been used are uh, basically uh, very common passwords people try to use right like clear 1234 or uh, password password uh, so if you go to google and search may any of the dictionary passwords or their pet names uh, their first names uh, last names as a password so these are the very common passwords people will try to use right so they will try to have these dictionary ids and then try to do the brute force attack so what is a remote desktop remote desktop is you trying to access a particular system over the internet right for with a user id and password as an authentication mechanism so this attack has happened uh, last week on all the remote desktop servers okay so what they try to do is basically they will first try to use one system uh, they will try to scan the internet for the remote desktop machines and there are about 1.5 million machines right now available over the internet for the remote desktops which will be they will be thinking they anyway need an id password so why not uh, why am i worried right so what they try to do is they try to attack one system one vulnerable system one one user who was not uh, careful enough with this password or not complex enough with this password uh, so they used the, the unique combination of uh, passwords they have from their dictionary and they brute force into that machine then use that machine as an attack vector now they will try to ask this machine or force this machine to go and scan other machines that are available on the internet and once uh, it scans they will put this they call it gold brute botnet malware okay that's the software that they try to use gold brute so it will give them the again the list of id passwords to this and once it successfully attacks it will send what was the successful id password to this attacker so right now microsoft has released only one patch uh, with the cv 20190708 and this is called dub blue keep so if you go to internet and type dub blue keep you will understand what is this vulnerability but there is still another unpatched vulnerability which windows is currently running since last one week where windows is where they can attack from the client side as well right so from a web service they can bypass the locked screen and directly enter without entering any id password into the remote desktop sessions so this was the another uh, latest uh, vulnerability that is out there so the reason i wanted to tell you this is to bring you a concept called a zero day vulnerability so as someone mentioned in the chat before you can patch the known vulnerabilities so what is a patch uh, basically any software vendor will release a correction to their code if they found a vulnerability in it but there are vulnerabilities that are not yet patched those are called zero day vulnerabilities right so all these viruses malwares will also have signatures so what is an anti malware software or anti virus software basically is uh they will have all these known signatures so they know where this virus go and sit in the memory or where this virus go and sit in the, uh, in the in the hard disk and they will try to see how the virus will execute and they will try to clean them up right but a zero day vulnerabilities or zero day attacks are those where there is no patch that is yet released but as a cyber security consultant you can think okay i can apply all the patches to the latest patch Uh, am i secure enough 
but you as i told you security contains three things right confidentiality integrity availability you have to think about the third portion called availability if you are applying all the patches to the latest level but if it is causing some functionality issue you will not know what to do in that case that is why in the industry they basically follow n minus 1 technology what is n minus 1 is if n is the latest patch you would like to have one version down to that so that the latest version is still undergo through testing you will never apply patches without testing because it may cause functionality damages as well so as a cyber security consultant you do not only think about the confidentiality integrity you have to think about availability scenarios as well if you do not have the source code you are not expected to do reverse engineering at this point the reason being is you if you do not have a source code that means you are getting a basically the uh, so basically uh, a software a licensed software from a particular vendor right then you are not expected to do the reverse engineering on that type of a tool because you are not expected to understand the source code out there but for example uh, hackers does this uh, reverse business engineering uh, to understand uh, you know the source code uh, if you are not handling the exceptions right or they get access to the byte code or bit code for example if you are writing a java code the java virtual machine will have a set of binary codes that are available and those codes by reverse engineering they will be able to understand what are the uh, basically what are the uh, code that you have written and then use it but you can re reverse business engineering you generally do only if you are trying to understand a particular product on your own or you are trying to not not using a licensed software because you are not expected to as a cyber security officer or a defending team you are not expected to do this but you use it only for ethical hacking that is the case where you can use it so there is a concept called ethical hacking where you are doing like uh, uh, like uh, you are if some, some sometimes what will happen is there are some services you can provide called white white list hacking or white hackers right what uh, what ethical hacker can do is you can give a your product and say this is my product you tell me if there are any vulnerabilities before i release it to the world out there or to the customers so you are expected to find what can, so they will not give you any sort of information about this tool other than what customers would see so then you will be able you will try to get hold of what is this uh, you know what is this software is all about what would you do and then you try to understand what is the uh, information that is available uh, from a basic hacking tools that are available uh, for example if you are trying to use if you are trying to understand network traffic there is a free tool called wireshark this is a tool that basically try to capture all the network traffic that is generating and you will be able to see what is the network coding or trafficking that is happening going through the packet level what if flood causes server down availability is it cyber security or another security it is part of cyber security because confidentiality integrity availability availability does come under cyber security so building resilience come under cyber security but you have to understand there can be various reasons so if you are mentioning about a flood that is real flood or a sink flood so sink floods are technical vulnerabilities so as a cyber security person you would want to be responsible for disaster recoveries not business continuity planning so the real floods like chennai where we had the floods where the where data centers were shut down that will go under business continuity planning that is beyond it scope cyber security is limited to it scope so within the business continuity planning the subset is called disaster recovery that is part of so that, that is part of the resilience on the systems that you are trying to build in from a cyber security perspective if a cyber incident happens how do you recover from the cyber incident the resilience that you put it in will be part of the cyber security did that answer your question thank you guys have a great day what are the learning objectives for today right uh, what is a client state manipulation what is a sql injection is all about how do we take care of password security what is a cross domain security in web applications a little bit on cryptography and as usual we'll have couple of case studies okay so
what i was uh, understand is uh, before you understand what is a client state okay let me start asking you a question what is cyber security what three properties are mandated or mandatorily required to call cyber security ca okay anybody else yes absolutely so it's confidentiality integrity and availability if any of these three uh, gets compromised then we call that uh, you know cyber security we are under cyber security threat so to understand this a uh, little bit uh, so let's try to understand what is more on the web application security so all the web applications basically go through a three tier architecture so how does it look uh, let me show you uh, this is how a typical client server architecture would look where you have multiple clients and requesting sources or services from server and server is uh, helping them with the clients right how does a three client architecture look in this scenario basically you is uh, you have an application server you have a database and you have a front end the front end is nothing but your client or browser so the browser makes a request to the services that are available in the server and there there is a logic built in the server to respond to this request or service and then there is a database if you see in the picture uh, that will be required uh, to store the data retrieve the data and respond to the request made by the client so we call this as a three tier architecture okay so what is a client basically client will contain something like your browser so to put it into a context gmail uh, email is a service provided by the vendor called gmail so your browser makes the request to access the emails the server have a logic to validate who you are what kind of emails you need to show the database will contain those credentials and the emails so it will retrieve and send it over the network so the client would view so this is what basically a client server architecture is all about yes it's a mail exchange server it's a, just an example right so basically what what i'm trying to explain you guys here is what is a client what is a server and what kind of services server provides and how they are being consumed by the client okay so what basically happening is for example if it is you your email server right so what should it happen you should enter your user id password then it will it should understand that your user id password validate its user id password and then respond with your emails that are available okay this is a typical example but for example if you want to do a simple dominos pizza order how do you do it so you go to dominos website so you call the website in so the home page has to be loaded then you prepare the order then you click submit then the server should receive the order make the payment processing and then issue the pizza so that is how a typical client server communications keep happening right so how does the server remembers when there are multiple clients as you can see in the picture there are multiple clients and making requests at the same time how does it keep track and ensure the responses are given appropriately for example if all of us are trying to order the dominos pizza at the same time and ordering various pizzas various numbers but the server should have the capacity to identify each one of us individually and ensure it is responding to us accordingly so that is very very important so moving on so what is the client state so client state is that that as i explained uh, having remembering who you are and what information you've been using we are communicating with the server and so that server can respond to you accordingly so how can you alter this client state so now we know that there is a client state for example you are ordering a pizza and you want to set only one at a time so you want to order one pizza at a time uh, but i want to order two pizzas at a time so when you are ordering that one pizza how can i go and alter that uh, basically that information or how does it keep track that you are the same and uh, you are not altering something in between right so what would server should do basically server should have the capacity to understand what you are inputting and process the payment accordingly for example if you are ordering one pizza 
then the amount of it uh, cascades to let's say 100 rupees one pizza basically calculated to 200 pizzas so what happened or what how does the basically client communication happens is on html pages so html is basically hypertext markup language and uh, it combines with a few other technologies that are right now available like cascading style sheets uh, and also uh, your javascripts basically javascript uh, if you are not aware this is not java so they use some of the basic programming techniques of java java and javascript are two different scripting languages right uh, you also see nowadays people using python as a different scripting language so these are the basic scripting languages that are used so what does it supposed to do basically uh, it should have the capacity to calculate, right? As we said, we could set one pizza equal to 100. If you're making two pizzas, then dynamically it should be able to show the odd, the amount of money you have to pay is 200 rupees. So where does this calculation should happen is what the question is. Does the calculation needs to happen on the browser side or the calculation needs to happen on the server side? Let's say the calculation is happening on the browser side. So what will happen? Server will send the sum of the code along with the information or the web page request you send. And as you type two, it should multiply and say 200 rupees. Now what can happen since the calculation is happening on your side, it can automatically do is basically, uh, if you go and alter the code and say, uh, instead of making it 200, you make it only 10 rupees. If you change the code, then automatically uh, at the client side, then the, you can manipulate and if the server is not validating the changes that you have made, then becomes the trouble. So let's see, we have getting some questions. Can central system monitoring system be client server architecture? You can monitor, but basically what is it that in the client server architecture it is talking about is a browser making a request a server have a set of processes and someone responding to that process from the server side and the client and the client is consuming that service okay this is a basic client server architecture so whatever monitoring systems you put for example you want to monitor all the network traffic that is communicating between the client and server it is not part of that architecture it is something that you are adding to your enterprise architecture Whenever you call client server architecture, it is basically a three tier architecture. You will have a presentation layer, an application layer, and a database layer. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, SD sessions, cookies, clients, HTML, non relational database. Okay. Yeah, that's not much question there. But yeah, uh, how to stop this client state? Server, Java, .NET, or various frameworks to list. Okay. How to stop the client state manipulation attack? So what happened now? Let's say that you have changed the value because the code is on the browser side, and when you are when the once the code is on the browser side, server have no control on the code, so you are going and modifying the data. So in that case you will not be able to alt. So as a server, if you are trusting it blindly, you have no control over the client state, right? As a server. So then you probably end up paying 20 rupees for the two pieces or uh, processing 20 rupees for the two pieces. So this is basically the maintenance of client state. So how do you stop the client state manipulation? As you see, there is only two things. One, instead of sending the code to the client, you manage that on the server side itself so that you don't have to have the code executed on the client side so you have the full control on the server side so we call it authoritative state on the server so what this means basically is all the calculations has to happen on the server side only so for example if you are giving your user id password and authenticating you can generate a session id so what is traversing over the network is your only session ID. So when four of us are ordering, each one of us can have an individual session ID added to each of us. Once the individual session ID is added, the server knows how to distinguish each of us and keep communicating with us. So if you take the example of Google, 
so where does the session id can be used for example would be uh, if it wants to track what kind of queries you are using so before you type the query it wants to show you automatically what you want to see or if you see nowadays in the google home page it will automatically show you some news that you have used or some based on the query searches you have used before or any of the google uh, services you have used before the google is providing you the same similar news out automatically on the home page this is because it is able to track your session cookies and uh, the main uh, pro or the advantage is over the network there is no much traffic or bandwidth is going only the session id that is being going on but the problem or con is if someone hijacks your session id that is since it is individually identifying each uh, client request by that session id if someone hijacks that session session id then they can impersonate as you they don't need your user id password because the session id is provided by server after you have authenticated and if i am able to hijack your session id then automatically i can impersonate uh, and i don't need to provide the server again the user id password so this you can imagine in terms of banking right for example you entered your user id password you made a transaction and uh, you didn't close the browser and you started working on something else uh, suddenly you will pop out saying your session is timed out so that is a practical example where they started using this so why you need to time out the session id so that people are not brute forcing and taking your session id using various other attacks so that is very important in terms of a session id so this is all the calculations happening on the server side now the if you want to do the reverse of it you don't want to have such a server capacity for example uh, in the user id password case uh, if there are 10000 users or 1 lakh users trying to use at the same time your service your server is opening then you are limited to the capacity of your database because every time you have to do a computation on the server side so that's the reason why some of the websites want to push this to the client side but of course you don't want to so what is the client side manipulation okay just uh, i'll come back to that question so what what is just complete this uh, statement that i'm making uh, so if you want to if you don't want to make the uh, alteration on the uh, if you don't want to make all the calculations on the server side it is very important then to move it to the client side why because if you are making every calculation on the server side and there are 1 lakh users trying to use your service then the server capacity has to be tremendously increased so that is the con side of it and it is limited to the size of its database or a computational speed of its database the pro is the well, you don't need a lot of band network bandwidth because only the session id is that's traversing and other con is if someone hijacks the session id then they can take uh, they can bypass the authentication mechanism and how do you prevent that is by putting session time out you don't want an indefinite time to be there so how much should be the recommended time out it depends on the type of service for example for banking i think they will put it around anywhere between 10 to 15 minutes but if it is an email service uh, you can put it to 8 to 12 hours like that depending on what service and how important that service to the customer on the session time out and uh, so just to recap what we learned so what is client manipulation client manipulation is once the code is delivered on the client side and the client state whatever the client is supposed to respond back to the server in case if it is genuine can be modified because the client is having a code that is running on the client side on the machine so malicious intent user can change the code one good example is if you want to order the pizza one pizza is 100 rupees that is what the code is delivered and whenever the user updates let's say one to two pizzas or three pizzas then the automatic calculation should happen or how much that three will multiply and by 100 it should be 200 or 300 so that calculation basically is it should it happen on the client browser itself or the calculation should happen on the server if it has to happen on the server the time it takes for the code to go that okay now user has changed 2 to 3 so now the value has to be updated to 300 so it has to travel over the network along with your session id and then the server has to calculate okay 3 multiplied by 100 300 then it has to identify from which 
client this request has come and respond back so the time it takes will depend on the server capacity and the network bandwidth as well so that is what is the client manipulation so in that case you have two choices do you want to run this code on the client side or do you want to run the code on server side both have its limitations and both have its advantages so what we saw is what is the advantages and limitations if you are running it on the server side that means if you put three teasers in the client then the domino server will receive okay uh, the user has entered gautam has entered three servers so let me multiply three by 100 make it to 300 and uh, then respond back to that client identify who has requested it out of five people and then respond accordingly so this is what is the response that you are going to get okay so in that case server you because the calculation is happening on the server side no calculation on the client side nobody can alter the clients uh, client so there is no client state manipulation happened now on the so what is the other logical thing you can do is since the one of the cons of running everything on server side is the server capacity so now i want to offload this work or calculation to the end user client or the browser so but i don't want them to do a client manipulation because the response i am receiving i should still be able to trust in that case what i can do is basically uh, the con you have to do is basically what you have to do is uh, to, uh, to come over that you need to generate a signed state so what is a signed state basically you will generate a hash out of uh, example the IP address the request is coming from and the message authentication code that you generate for the message that you want to send along with the user ID that he is requesting so with all these combinations if you generate a, a particular uh, hash and then you send it over to the client if someone is trying to for example on a client state manipulation overtaking my session so when you overtake my session and send another request saying okay order 100 pizzas because now let's say i have already put my credit card number uh, before con when the confirmation is over going to the server he hijacked the message and said instead of three pizzas make it 100 pizzas now before the server processes it it will regenerate the hash out of it then the ip address of mine will be different from the ip address of the hijacker in that case i know that i can drop this uh, transaction because i know that there is a client state manipulation happened so that is the advantage of doing the uh, signed state to the client uh, the next thing is uh, so how do you generally do uh, requests over uh, browsing is http hypertext markup pro markup protocol so http is basically a stateless protocol what is stateless protocol it basically do not track your status so http generally communicates over the port number 80 so some of the uh, details i'm giving so that you can use it when you are going through the other modules as well because in real time the attacks are not just one attack they will combine it with various attacks to get the steal the data or to make it a complete successful attack so some of these things I'm trying to tell you so that it helps you. So the other protocol that we have around HTTP is HTTPS. So that is HTTP over an encryption. HTTP is a stateless protocol and all the communication that happens is over a clear text. So all the communication that happens on the network is not secure. So HTTPS listens on port number 8080 and everything that happens on HTTPS will be encrypted. So when it is encrypted, you will not be able to see what is the message that is traversing, but you can always alter. So that is very important to understand. Uh, encryption only ensures confidentiality and not integrity. So what do I mean by that? If you are sending a message, let's say one, two, three, four from person A to person B, if I have access and you are, since you encrypted one, two, three, four, I may not be able to read what is in it, but instead of that, if I know what encryption you are using, I can send 5678 and send to person B in between by staying in between uh, and then using the same encryption. So when person B decrypts it, he thinks it is 5678 what person has sent instead of 1234. 
Okay, remember always encryption ensures confidentiality, not integrity. Now, uh, what is HTTP GET and POST methods? Basically, GET is a way you go and get the request or you go and get the uh, generate the when you want to generate the session IDs. So what happens is when you are using HTTP GET method in the code, uh, your URL will contain your session ID. So where, how does this basically work is, for example, uh, you having a website uh, and uh, you want to give a reference to another website. In that case, you want to put HTTP GET method to get the other reference, okay? And now when you click on that website, on that ad, so what can happen in that case is, uh, when you click on that ad, your session ID might pass on because you are using HTTP GET method to the next website. Your website might be secure, but not the reference website that you have given. In that case, what will happen? The URL will contain your session ID so somebody can steal your session ID. Because the session ID is the unique identifier for each user, once the session ID is compromised, your user, uh, your user is compromised because uh, the attacker can take over your session, right? So as we discussed, session ID basically is a unique ID uh, that, is that is given by the server uh, for each user so that it can identify each user separately. And that should be a very confidential information for user. But if your session ID is passed on to another website because you used a HTTP GET method, the data can be leaked and the attacker can use that. So what you can do in that case is, there is something called HTTP POST method, which can be used, where if you use HTTP POST method, uh, the session IDs are not included in the URLs or browsers, it will be only in the body of the context. So in that case, what will happen is session IDs will not be passed over. So it is very important to understand. Uh, like for example, you want to put secure coding standards. So basically why you need to learn this is in, in real time, uh, you probably might be, uh, your developer will be developing the code, a web application as a cyber security person. Uh, you probably have to go and uh, review the code for vulnerabilities. So that is when you will see that if someone is using HTTP GET methods, you can say, hey, this is vulnerable. You should start using HTTP POST methods instead. Because the developer might not think how the information can be used or how the information can be used for hijacking. If a session is hijacked, yes. Basically, once the session is hijacked, that means the session ID is generally generated after the authentication to identify the user uniquely. So that is the reason why if you see your banking website, uh, your session, after your session is expired, you will have to authenticate again, uh, then only you will be able to start using. So what is your session? What is your banking session? For example, once you log in, you want to check your balance, then it is your session. You did, after checking your balance, you didn't make any transaction in your bank website. You waited for 10 minutes, then the session times out. You'll get a browser message saying your session is timed out, right? So then what you have to do, you have to re-authenticate. But if the session is still active, the good example is your Gmail, right? If you put your user ID password and uh, you, you have done it and then you closed it without uh, logging out, then what will happen? If you open again, type gmail.com, it will automatically open your Gmail with passwords. It will not ask you for ID password again because your session is still active. So it is important that is why that your unique identifier gets wiped out on the server side only when you log out. So that is one defense against people doing a session timeout. And also, if you have a longer time session active, the person can try a various methods, hacker can try various methods to hijack your session. That's why sensitive transactions like Paytm or uh, uh, internet banking sites, they will do a session timeout faster. Okay, now we understood what is a session, right? So the other thing you need to understand, there are two things, very important words, cookies and JavaScript. So the server, instead of giving just session ID, it can give you the cookie. So what does the cookie contain? It can contain more information than just in the session ID, uh, like what was your uh, unique identification address, where you are coming from, what was your username, what was the ports to connect to. So, so a cookie can contain a lot more information. And uh, as a cybersecurity officer, you also need to understand now various 
countries have various rules and regulations on cookies so that is why if you see uh, many websites that you are trying to use uh, they will say that uh, we are tracking cookies uh, as a disclaimer and uh, for example in australia they even have the rule for cookies like uh, in your website what uh, how much font you need to use to display that you are tracking cookies so why server need to cap, uh, keep tracking of cookies is to ensure it is uniquely identifying you but what is the problem of governments is for example this server can be sitting anywhere and you have your uniquely identifiable information in it like your ip address or mac address as part of a cookie then for example uh, the server is in russia then russian government wants to look into this details then it can uniquely identify a person right so it it comes cookies are coming pii in some of the countries so you have to ensure if you are using if you are reviewing a, if you are building a server that is going to track cookies whether it is as per local regulations and legislations or not so that is also very important because as a cyber security person you are not only looking into technical aspects of things you also need to aware what are the regulations as well and then comes javascript so as you understand that um, uh, the, so there is some code that can be executed on server side or client side and uh, some of these uh, uh, some of these websites can include some of these uh, scripts yeah, one of the good example is a javascript uh, that can run on the client side of things for example the calculation that you wanted to do like 2 multiplied by 100 should be 200 so it should be having the capacity to read the input and then do the multiplication of it right so that is the uh, so javascript is one of the language used so generally in any typical website you take you will find html xhtml css that is cascading style sheets and the script the scripts can be javascript is one of the examples so this is about client state manipulation so one important thing you need to understand is any once you establish a communication between a client and a server whatever the communication that is coming from the client if it has to be trusted by server then it should have a signed state to the client otherwise all the calculation should be happening on the server side one of the pros and cons of running this code on client side or server side is if you are running it on the server side every communication has to traverse over the network and also if you are limited to the capacity of the server to respond to each of these requests and what will happen if the request exceed is you will uh, you will be bound to dos attack for example if your server has the capacity to uh, respond to 100 requests per minute if it receives 1000 requests per minute what would happen the server would crash the very best good example in india we all faced practically is the ircpc website every time you try to book a railway ticket i'm sure all of you would have uh, faced the situation that you couldn't book your ticket because the server was slow at least that was the case before right before the servers were upgraded so that is the uh, one example of a client state so you have to ensure that whatever the input that is coming from client state has to be recalculated on the server or you should be able to drop the uh, information coming from the client if it is not matching with hashing that you have done okay and it is recommended to use http post methods so this is all about client state manipulation so before i move on any questions on client state manipulation okay let's try to understand what is a sql injection so what is a sql injection basically sql injection is you have a vulnerability how you have written your code to parse the input provided by user what do i mean by that is when you give an input for example in the password field you give an input your code should have the capacity to understand that the input that you are giving is only at the data not a command for example if as an input if i am giving 1 equal to 1 1 will always be equal to 1 but if that is the input that i have given then it should be able to understand when it is parsing the code when it is parsing that oh 
the input that was given is uh, not uh, the code i am not supposed to treat it this like an as part of sql command i should treat this as an input now how i know how much ever i keep talking about it you will get confused so i have an example to show you so what we what we said is basically what is a sql injection i was talking about is when you give an input it should think that the input that you have given is a part of the text input not the sql command so let's try to understand this by going through this website so basically what is this is you will you will see an application that is trying to let's say uh, a funny application that it's a bank and uh, you want to give an input a user id and password click login then if it is a right user id password it should let you in if it is wrong then it should stop it okay so if that is what is expected let's see how it behaves now and then we will also see how the log and sql command comes in so let's try to put some user id here user at email.com and let me put a password as password and click login now see what would happen see in the logs it is trying to check the supplied authenticated details for user at the email.com it is finding the user in the database then rendering the login page that is it put in basically so i gave find the password and i gave a wrong password so it was unable to interpret it now let's try to put a sql commands as part of password so password a single quote so generally if you look at the uh, any kind of language the single quote means it will uh, try to understand where there is an end quote as well right so then it will try to when i give this input if it treats it as an input not as the single quote not part of a sql command then it should again say password is incorrect if this password is wrong but if treat if it starts treating this input the single quote that i entered as a last character as part of the sql injection command then it will automatically end up as an error because it will abruptly end the sql command of trying and searching the user id password let's see what would happen see checking supplied authentication details for user and now it ended why look at the syntax error here undetermined quoted string at or near password limit 1 where email equal to so you can see the command how it happened so you have a line one where it is starting email equal to as your email so if you see how the sql command is written there is a single quote and there is a single quote here and password equal to password password but what happened how did we give the input so if this is how it was supposed to come how did it receive input select star from users that is users is a table basically where email equal to this and password became like this double quote so what it happened basically the sql command is failed so that is why it is unable to process your input so this is basically what you tried to do is you crashed the application okay so that is what we have seen now so how did it look in the code side so as i said password it is trying to take instead of treating the single quote you entered here as a password it is treating as a sql command that is why it failed so let's see how it looks the code side so if you see this this is what we already explained so let's move on now this is a another typical case if i give this what would happen 1 equal to 1 quote quote so how many of you know how does sql work so can someone guess what would happen now if i give this input so what would happen so basically if i give this input so i have related position 1 equal to 1 is always true correct so what would happen is it would go and pass try to parse this yes that's right sd 
double quote would mean it would stop further processing absolutely yes it will try to get all the data so what would happen it will try to go select star from user it will look at this user id and then it will look at the password not all the data okay return entire users table what is it trying to do so it is trying to find where is this user id and password correct and you are entering the password ideally that means it should bypass the password controls isn't it yes see it bypassed because the password is always returning as true the code is the code they would have written is trying to get the output of this as when the password is correct then it will limit to one then it will go so basically what i have done is by putting these two single quotes i am disabling any further code after this so if you see this became this length of the sql command became inactive because i am saying ignore if i give this symbol that means ignore anything written after this so this became ignored yes it will return everything about that user because the user password is successful now okay so this is the good example of sql injection so i just thought uh, giving a practical example would make more sense than how much ever in theoretical i speak about uh, sql injection so let's take questions on sql injection before i try to share my screen back on the presentation let me know if you guys can see the screen now okay great so we have already seen i am not going to explain again what is a sql injection you have seen it with your own yes you can do sql conversions on windows as well basically anywhere there is a user input right you can you can put a sql command so one good example is anywhere uh, user id password is an input but even in the browser if you are trying to type www.google.com/anything else right there also you can put a input and anywhere there's a user input field available and if you are not uh, if the code is written unsafe then they can do a sql injection on top of it so what we have seen is this bypassing the authentication injection right so what you can do instead of this let's say that uh, you know it's not a user id password screen uh, but uh, it is uh, like you know but it, uh, let's say that uh, anywhere anywhere uh, if uh, there is an user input is required it is it is uh, uh, possible to uh, sql injection attack but since sql injection attacks are becoming more and more uh, common uh, people whenever you run through those uh, code scanning vulnerability tools uh, it will automatically pop these vulnerabilities out so unless uh, the code is written really really bad and uh, especially for authentication right this one equal to one is a very very good example so there are functions that are available now in each language uh, to process them safe uh possible ways to defend against a sql injection using prepared statements data blending yes we will we will come to that how how we are going to do that if the backend is sql the attack will work yes uh, basically anywhere it just not a uh, backend is sql right uh, any um, any language that you are trying to use to query the database uh, if uh, the and the comments that you are trying to use then yes uh, the injection would work we just call it sql because that is a most commonly used uh, querying language and uh, so how do we defend okay let's try to understand what are the types questions are pouring in um let's uh, give give a minute to understand a little bit more on sql and then i come back input field data validation is required very much yes it is uh, it just not the input field data validation the, the problem comes is when you are trying to validate data also you will write a code and even they they will crack that code as well so it is very important how do we ensure 
we teach the program to understand the input that user is giving is not a sql command or it is not supposed to be treated as a sql command and it should be treated as a uh, input only or a characters only it shouldn't think that it is part of a user command so one good example right uh, in the if you have gone through the slide deck uh, stanford was giving is a username uh, obrian right so how do how it is written o o single quote brian obrian so you cannot explain why a user cannot have his name as obrian because you have a problem with single quotes so what people generally you can do in that case you can either do blacklisting or whitelisting that is the simplest thing you can think of saying that okay i don't want user to give any of this inputs if this input is given rejected so anyone giving an input with single quote rejected then it would become a blacklist but how many you can blacklist there are hundreds and thousands of varieties of ways how you can hack into so that is one reason why blacklist may not be a great idea then the next thing you have to do is instead of blacklist let's try to put a whitelist so what inputs you can agree or what inputs only you can take so one of the good examples is sometimes when you are using the websites now uh, it will say that only these characters are allowed or these spacings are not allowed something like this uh, you know you will get and then you have to change the password according to their rules only right or the or create the username based on their rules only uh, special characters are not allowed as part of username or something like that you keep occurring right so that is the part of how uh, you do the blacklisting and whitelisting but as always not everything uh, you can stop in doing a blacklisting or whitelisting oh if that is the case what else i can do the best way you can do is create them as prepared statements so what will happen instead of uh, in the previous example where you have seen select star from users where email equal to you put a question mark and expect the program to process the input in place of the placeholder so those are called uh, prepared statements so how the prepared statement would look like is select okay let me type it in a notepad or actually in the chat window so you can all see how does it how does it look for the previous case select star from users where you name let's say it was e name or u name i don't remember what was it equal to question mark and password equal to single quote question mark single quote and then you what, what do you do is each each of those inputs then you try to parse separately then what would happen is then the program will understand that oh the input i am receiving is only the data not the sql injection at all so the best uh, method of doing this is by doing this prepared statements and then also doing escaping so escaping is another form where if it finds an unexpected uh, query that comes out it will automatically escape or drop the input and ask the user to input again so that is the other example of that so these are all additional things you can do in sql not just authentication union based injection that is for example uh, in the pizza example we took uh, you want to know uh, what was the previous pizzas yes you can use the sort procedures and pass the parameters as well for defense absolutely so in the previous example what we took you generally do a combination of these not just one method will work for everything right so you obviously want to disallow some of the things that you don't want to allow which are known and also you want to disallow those uh, you know uh, prepared statements you use and then go in depth of uh, sql injections right so then you also want to do hardening of your database and operating systems so that uh, you know uh, the query the you are not your database is not susceptible uh, to the known vulnerabilities so what is hardening means you apply the patches that are applicable to your database and operating system uh, so that uh, you are not your information or you are not getting queried at that level database or object system levels right there are various levels of defense you can put in that case so again coming back to what was the union based uh, injection 
uh, union based is for example in the last example we took uh, for pizza uh, you want to create an experience uh, so uh, when once you log into the account you want to see what was the last ordered pizza probably you have the same favorite pizza you want to order it again so you should be able to go query what was the list of uh, pizzas that you have ordered last time or in last one month for example then it should show that output so instead of so one of the inputs that you probably would want to select is uh, last month a month as an input so instead of month as an input if you try to put a sql query and let's say they haven't put the difference in place and then you write union of uh, in in the inputs you try to get the union of the credit card details that are already stored for a stored credit card or a credit card table if you write that and if it is parsed as part of that then what would happen the output would actually be the credit cards instead of the last month pizza input so that is how people can use the union based injections error based is like the single quote we have given so when you give a single quote it uh, errored out application got errored out right so that is an error based sql injection and then there are blind sql injections where people are not aware they just keep trying various inputs to see if there is a vulnerability in your query or code that you have written so this is a good example of a sql injection before moving on uh, any questions that i missed or not used i think i answered all your questions so i am hoping now you all understand how does the sql injection work uh so no sql dbs mongo dbs uh, no so if we, if you are not using the sequels uh, then sql injection is not possible there uh, because uh, those are not uh, where the sql commands are being prepared but uh, they can use uh, browser so the attacks sql injection attacks cannot only be at the database layer right you can even attack at the application layer for example on the html command page or url request page uh, you can make the injection possible as well so yeah then you are susceptible at an application layer instead of a db layer any other questions did i miss okay cool. i got to this ganesh yes yeah actually most of the uh, time actually application level only it will happen the sql injection right actually compared to database level it chances are yes uh, it's basically uh, how much information you are uh, errors are throwing out is what will determine which layer the hacker chooses to attack uh, okay. if you look at the application log that we have seen in the given example uh, okay. it was so detailed in nature Uh, it was showing that uh, okay, it expected an unexpected input at this so and so phase of a single code, so I have uh, terminated. So okay. then I exactly know what kind of a database you are using, uh, what kind of query you are using, what was the, your table name. So I this have... is where uh, exception handling that we learnt in the previous phase come into the uh, come into the picture. How okay. much information you are giving uh, when you are and uh, when you are it is terminating abruptly, how you are handling those things. Okay. so moving on to password security i know one of uh, you requested uh, talk a little bit more on salting so let's try to understand uh, uh, what is the uh, password why we need a password basically what is required so we basically want to prove the authenticity that this person is who he claims to be if the password is leaked or password is hacked uh, then uh, you have the problem that you will compromise the authenticity of the user Uh, one good example i as i told you no one attack is one attack is required to make an end to end attack successful right so let's say i found a sql injection problem uh, but uh, i pro i found it in such a way that i may know i may be able to bypass only one user not every user uh, but uh, i will make use of the union of the sql injection and i found all the passwords that are stored on the database so let's say password table got compromised generally what it will contain password table user id and password then my attack is much more devastating because i'm not compromising one user i'm compromising all the users in the table database table so that becomes more devastating so obviously as an attacker i would like to go after something like that so if i am a 
uh, if I'm basically a user, uh, basically I'm a developer, what I need to do, I need a, obviously a password table and I need the user's password so that I need to parse when user gives me an input and give him an output whether he is a right user or not. So that is mandatory. So what can I do now? Uh, in case of, because I always have to put uh, techniques that are defense in depth or we call layered security. That is, first step is not to ensure that my SQL is, uh, SQL query injection is not possible. Even if it is successful, I don't want, uh, even if a password table goes out, they will be able to understand or leak all the user ID passwords. If that is what I need to do, what I need to do? I need to do basically is, I have to keep the passwords in an encrypted format, right? So let's say when a user sends me a password, I should be I should be able to read, understand, and when I'm trying to go compare it against my database table, I should be able to encrypt, uh, decrypt the password and read it again. In that case, even if the password file goes out, uh, they will not be able to uh, understand. One good example is in unique servers, uh, generally the password table is slash dev slash password. That is where the password table uh, lies, right? In any, any sort of Unix flavor uh, systems. So if that gets leaked out, because since the structure is so common, uh, you know, if that gets leaked out, you don't want uh, the password file, every user's user ID needs to be compromised. So what do we do in that case is we want to encrypt. Okay, great. So if it is encrypted, so imagine how the sequence would happen. A user has to enter the password. The password has to be read. And uh, then what would happen is once the password is read, uh, you have to understand uh, you, whatever you, you have to look at it in the database table that has to be decrypted and then compared. If this is what you have to do, the time it takes is so long. So instead what you can do, let the user send the password and then you compare it in an you computer one way format that is encryption. So you compare that encryption against the encryption that you saved in the database instead of you decrypting the password that is stayed, that is uh, stored in the database. In that case, what can happen? You can just compare the encryption versus encryption. So how to put it in a simple format, for example, your password is 1234. I've encrypted it, it becomes 5678. Now the user enters his password as 1234. You recompute the encryption, then it will become 5678. So I'll compare 5678, 5678 is matching. That means user entered the right password, let him through. This is nothing but hashing. So this is one way encryption. What is the difference is, I will not have a key to retrieve 1234 from 5678. 1234 was the original password. 5678 is your encrypted password or let's say ABCD. ABCD is your encrypted password. So if you can't retrieve 1234 back from ABCD and there is no way, no mechanism exists, then my password file is always safe. Because even if the password file leaks out, what you will see user ID as Gautam, password as ABCD. And if I can never retrieve the ABCD is actually means is 1234, then it is always safe. But the problem of this is dictionary attacks. So what does an offline dictionary or an online dictionary can basically do is, since it is a very common password 1234, they will try to compute because they, if they know what type of an encryption algorithm am, am I using, and they do the encryption of all sort of known passwords and they keep it ready. So somewhere when they encrypted one, two, three, four, they'll get ABCD. So again, it's my name. The encryption is also ABCD. Then now they know what is the password. Oh, since I know one, two, three, four, and it is ABCD. If it is ABCD, then the password is one, two, three, four. This is called forward attack, right? Because forward encryption, because what I did is I'm doing a basically taking all the dictionary words and comparing it. So since I compared the hashes, I came to know, oh, okay, this is the password, right? Even though I cannot retrieve, if I don't know what is uh, uh, 1234, uh, if I only know ABCD, but I can try all the possible combinations and come up with various hashes and do the hash comparison. So this is what is hashing. So two important things to note is, hashing is one way encryption. So only possible attack of retrieving the original uh, text from the encrypted text is you trying all the combinations and then comparing the encrypted text is hashing. Now what is salty? Okay, if this is the case, 
uh, the only attack if i am having a hashed passwords in my table then the only possible way to uh, get over this is to have the uh, encrypted format okay so even if the file is leaked i thought i was not i've safe but now i am no more safe because if you see last best passwords people generally use password as password clear 1234 or date of birth year of birth or uh, generally the most common password is password is equal to itself is password so these are all commonly used passwords from top 10 passwords being observed or dictionary words right people use clear 1234 or people use uh, i am the i am the greatest or generally the company name people use i have observed is the company name uh, so if you work for a company they will combine it with the year of the joining or they use the same company name itself as the password these are all very easily guessable passwords because they are coming out of the dictionary and people compute hashes then you can they can really easily compare and the other thing if you see what uh, attacker has to do is for all the known dictionary words or those easily guessable passwords he has to generate hash once and he have the list ready the cheat cheat sheet is ready then he can go and start comparing against any hash so what we thought is from a defense perspective okay if i force you to generate hashes again for all the password combinations that will take a long time to generate that cheat sheet again right because the dictionary words are so many so that is where salting comes into help so what it basically does is since i cannot force each user i cannot trust each user is choosing so tough passwords and uh, i cannot reject every password user is trying to do i use is what my own random characters i call it salt okay for example the password i chose before if you remember in the example was 1234 so along with 1234 i will choose when user enters input as 1234 when i am trying to store that password in my database table password table what i will basically do is i will choose some random characters and i add that also and then generate hash out of it so just instead of generating hash for 1234 which is abcd now i will add 1234 plus uh let's say that random characters of a h y k and then i generate a hash out of it now what will happen my database table will contain three fields user id password and the hash so user id password uh, user id instead of password it is hash and the salt that i have used to generate this so what it means now user since it has to do a call, let's say now he have the password file then what it has to do along with 1 2 3 4 he has to find what was the salt value and generate hashes for each of the dictionary password so each dictionary word he has to add this a h y k and then again generate hashes and then do a comparison which will basically demotivate or takes longer time again because no cheat sheet will work because each password is unique so each for each password each uh, random salt uh, is unique so he has to generate hashing for each password and then do a comparison so that is how hard salting will help basically by adding the random bit of characters but when you are doing a pi password comparison you need the salt that was used because that is why you have to use uh, you have to store the salt in the password table yes hash of password plus random salt is what you will store in place of a password so any questions now on salting where to store the salt salt will be stored on the same table because you need to know what was the salt when user enters the right password for you to validate so what it what you are basically doing by doing this is a hacker who have the cheat sheet of all the dictionary hashes now no more valid because now he has to add this hash or this salt uh, to each of the dictionary words and generate the hash which will take longer time to generate the hash but is it still crackable yes it is still crackable right because uh, if uh, now with super computers the amount of time it takes uh, for people to uh, generate these uh, 
uh, hashes again for all the known dictionary words is so high that is why uh, now people try to use or uh, prohibited passwords they call it so they will try to use this to ensure that uh, uh, you know uh, so using this uh, basically to ensure that uh, user is not inputting some of those easily guessable passwords okay uh, so uh, what were the additional password securing techniques we can use uh, one is the strong passwords as we explained uh, what is filtering filtering is again the method where you can uh, filter out those uh, easy passwords out and say that don't use them honey pots uh, you create some of those user ids with dictionary passwords which are dummy nobody will log in using them but suddenly if you find a login with that user id password then you know that oh okay so someone compromised my database table or use one time password one time password is uh, basically like yeah two factor authentication that's a good example uh, uh, because uh, you get that otps that is what we are using our banks you did not get honey pot okay uh, in your user in your user id database table you create those dummy user ids with dictionary passwords like clear 1234 okay and if the attacker attacks your entire table then that will be the easiest password first he will crack so the moment he is cracked he probably will try to log in so you will keep an alert that generally this is a dummy user id so nobody should be logging in the moment you find somebody logged in then you know that your user id passwords are compromised so that is what is honey pot okay one time password you know otp we all know in india that it's a double two factor authentication it's just not the password you probably need something that will come on your mobile it is very difficult for the hacker to use image authentication if you used hdfc bank yeah captcha or or if you used a hdfc bank you would have seen that it would have asked you to select an image basically why it is used is uh, you will not you are not supposed to enter your password unless you know that that image belongs to you so what basically it does is uh, it will stop those uh, impersonating or phishing attacks also so what is a phishing attack uh, for example they try to build a website that absolutely looks like a icici website or hdfc website and uh, then it will ask you to put the user id password so what what then we would do if you since you thought it is a real id password and you put the id password and this user id password they will pass over to the real website and whatever then they will try to let you log into the real website then in between they have captured your user id password because that website may look similar for everybody right so they can build a website that absolutely look like icicibank.com because but if you see hdfcbank.com what they have done is on their website the moment you put your user id it will appear one small piece of image so what does that image basically would do is uh, if you that image is personalized for each user so attacker may not be able will not be able to build that website for each user right so you will not enter the password until you know that that is your image that you have chosen that is the image authentication and uh, how does this help okay so image authentication basically you are not entering the password right without thinking without knowing whether that is your image or not so nobody will be able to impersonate icici bank or hdfc bank.com and then you fall prey because let's say that they they change one capital letter or small letter here and there and then send you okay if you log in today and make 100 rupee transaction you chance you stand a chance to win ipad okay you think okay that is hdfc website and you click on that link it absolutely looks like hdfc website when you put your user id before putting password you will see oh that image is not what i thought or that is not my personalized image so this might be some dubious website so that is how it will help okay yes awareness is the best defense against phishing uh, coming back to the next question what stops the attacker from getting otp as well is it because the otp is generated from a server other than your own server service mode is server plus allowing otp only for a limited time uh, yes uh, it's basically the, the attacker would have attacked your laptop for example right uh, so he attacked your laptop your browser session and uh, he logged in as you uh, to so that now let's say he logged in to your bank account because he hijacked your session or your cookie and he logged in 
now what happens he has to make a transaction to make a transaction uh, now either you need a one type otp password or previously in icici bank we used to have something called transaction password separately and also you need to enter a grid so basically they are making multiple checkpoints for the hacker to hack into okay so that is the password security and otp is only for the limited time because obviously you don't want it to be longer time the longer the time is you can try multiple times a wrong otp and he may able to crack it if it is three character or four character yes the otp server will also be different it will not be the same coming or generating from the same banking server so that is on password security any questions okay again cross domain security in the web application so basically what does this is if you are trying to do a scripting in your website and it has user can put a input of a scripting and then it try to hijack your session then we call it cross site scripting again how much ever i talk uh, it won't be equal to if i show an example so let me go back and show you an example so what is it that we are trying to build here on a cross site scripting let's moving on uh, imagine that you are a owner of a so basically you are a company of a bread making company and you are giving a chart window for people to interact with each other okay so let's see how does it work because the main use of the website is to facilitate discussions users can add comments which are saved in the database and displayed to other users okay that is the basic communication so it's basically a chat window so a user is commenting something that i dream of baking tins i love it so much i think it might be part of duck and now a hacker coming into play okay unfortunately the popularity of the site has attracted the attention of hackers who wants to access your site for nefarious purpose okay so what do you do unless you are carefully constructing your html hackers can abuse the comment function by injecting javascript so for one good example is so let's try to inject a malicious javascript so this is what is the script looks like right so he he made a he made it appear your presents are limp and sad so he made he made basically written a java code in the window and it made it appear on the browser so it actually made it happen here right so it made a prompt let's move on so this is how you can he is trying to hijack again a script to get the cross site scripting so he hijacked the script of a session cookie of the other user and he try to put it in the password of something else or he try to take a hijack of the session so his session got hijacked let's try to do the same as well so if we have the chance to put let's try to put uh, something like a port function right so you put a port what would happen every time a user tries to put it will automatically try to upvot every time user is trying to do so this is a good example of cross site scripting so again i'll try to take you back to the steps so those of you who thought it is too faster so this is basically a chart window so you are putting there a chart so user is trying to respond so he's trying to put a javascript in place so what is basically how do you put script slash script is the starting and ending if you see so he made a alert appear on the client side or the receiver side's browser so beyond that he can also do is the so he is putting the windows location to hacks.com he is adding the cookie and then making it appear here right so he is doing a permit session hijacking right so it's important let's try to do one of alerts as well why is it not giving that option 
Şöyle diyor. So let's try to put script alert. Now we understand. Let's say cross site scripting. Quote. Close. And then put slash script. If I enter this, what should happen? So if I put this, no, automatically. Okay, yeah, we can try. Uh, somebody wants to try prompt. Yeah, you can prompt. Script. Prompt. Do you understand? Question mark, close, slash, script. See, so you're basically taking over someone's session because you are using your chat window and using the vulnerabilities that are built around the website that is accepting these inputs and then you are giving a cross-site scripting because of that. So you are allowing the scripting on the cloud side. So this is again a good example of a cross-site scripting. Any questions? Everybody clear? So sometimes I thought instead of talking in too many words, it's easy when you see it in live. How does it happen? I hope it makes sense to you guys. Let me share back the presentation. So you see that now? Now going on, so just to, again, for the theory perspective, let's clear it, uh, uh, let's clear it a little bit. Uh, so how does it work? So, uh, stands for cross-site scripting. So attacker using the scripting to attack the database and then getting the response, right? So you're using those HTML tags. This is what you use basically script and script, and then you put a alerts in between, right? This is what is called cross-site scripting. And there are various methods in this. So you can use authenticated user to send a forged HTTP request, including victim session cookies to a vulnerable application, which allows the attacker to force the victim's browser to generate request, which is not actually made by the user. So this is like you are pushing the user. You can make the user push whatever uh, he thinks as well by taking over his session cookie. If you see the second example we gave, uh, the uh, basically the cat image that appeared, it is because you overtook the session in session ID of the user and then you forced him to load a particular image from a particular website, right? So what you basically did is you forced him to send a request, his browser to send a request to a website and load that page, which he, he actually not made, right? So that is what is the basic uh, thing of a cross-site scripting is all about. So any questions on cross-site scripting? Cool. Now let's move on to cryptography concept. Okay. So we kind of touched upon on the last session as well. And I know that not all of you have covered it uh, completely uh, or read it completely in the fourth session. So I'll try to give a brief overview. And in the next session, again, I will start with cryptography a uh, little bit on a couple of slides here. So that, uh, you know, 
uh, you will be able to still able to understand okay someone is asking cross site scripting injections so basically what you can do is you can inject these uh, cross site scriptings uh, in such a way that uh, you know uh, the browser that the uh, users are using uh, the vulnerabilities within the browser itself so how does it basically work is when you are writing those scripts uh, from a, from a, a command line uh, the user inputs are not getting validated automatically so when it reaches the uh, when it reaches the uh, server server thinks it is actually coming from the client uh for, for example you are doing it from a person a to person b uh then the server thinks the request is actually originating from person b itself okay so that is what is the injection because basically you are injecting on the code that you wanted onto his browser and making that browser uh, uh request for resources what it is not explaining what it is not expecting to do uh i have not obviously built an example for that uh because uh, this is something uh, you need an app to build around it uh, but let me see maybe in the next session if i find some good example uh, that i can show you guys and show you that I'll, i'll i'll keep that in mind if that's something that can be done the next thing is uh moving on to cryptography uh so as i said i will touch base uh, on a very high level uh, cryptography and then i'll come back again next session as well uh, so that you know you are not missing something or when you read something again you have some doubts you can clear it again right so what is a cryptography so basically cryptography uh, is to ensure uh, that uh, the message that you are sharing is uh, going with the uh, from person a to person b and the confidentiality integrity and availability if all of them is maintained then we call it good but what would happen is uh, basic purpose of encryption started is to ensure confidentiality so in the war times what what time time zones they want to send a message secretly to a war zone so they don't want an opponent to know it so they started using codes so that is the origin of actually the cryptography so if you see in this example Uh, so you need a code, basically. Uh, as we always take example of one two three four. Let's do the same thing. You want to send the data that have one two three four from person A to person B. So first you have to encrypt it. So encryption is transferring this one two three four to A B C D encryption, right? So you encrypt with a key, and now when after it reaches the destination, you want to retrieve what is the original message from A B C D. So you need again a key. so you need an again a key to decrypt it so then that will become the decryption of it so encryption and decryption so whenever the uh, key is same that is to encrypt and decrypt it is called symmetric key that is it there is a similarity there is the same key that is used to encrypt and then there is the same key to decrypt but if the keys are different then the, then what would happen the decryption and uh, then encryption will happen with one key decryption will happen another key what are the pros and cons you can think of the simple if you want to encrypt and decrypt with the same key then the key should have already been shared between person a to person b if the key is not already shared uh then if the key while well, if the key gets compromised then anybody who is in between can read the message and understand the message because now he have the key the advantage is the encryption and decryption is very very faster okay then that is why we call it uh, uh, symmetric key pro is it is faster the con is you have to share the same key across okay then the difference is the opposite is asymmetric key now what is asymmetric key you use a different key to encrypt and different key to decrypt then obviously you don't need a key exchange right so but the problem or con is the performance the time it takes for the key gets exchanged is much much larger that is why uh, generally in real time you use a combination of these two so now what do i mean by combination of these two is we want to use the symmetric key to exchange the data but to exchange the key itself 
we use the asymmetric key encryption. So to come back again, what I have said, for example, if I want to send the data that is one, two, three, four from person A to person B, we use symmetric key encryption. So one, two, three, four will become ABCD with one key. Use the same key again to decrypt ABCD back to one, two, three, four. This is symmetric key encryption. This is what we are using to encrypt the data. The data here is one, two, three, four. But to exchange that symmetric key, between person A and person B, what you need to do is you need to exchange the key as well over the network and you don't want the key to get compromised. So that is when we use asymmetric key. What asymmetric key is? You encrypt with the key that you have and let's say that key that transfers 1, 2, 3, 4 to A, B, C, D is um, 0, 0, 0, 0. Okay, that is the symmetric key. Now you want to exchange this 0, 0, 0, 0 between person A and person B. So what he does is the key that he have to encrypt 000, he will do that and send it over. And what person B does, person B will, what he will do is basically he, since he have his own key to decrypt that message and read 000 out, we call it asymmetric key because the key is not exchanged in between. So the advantage of it is now you have shared the symmetric key securely from person A to person B. That is one good thing. And the second thing here is uh, basically um, you are also overcoming the limitation of the time it takes because uh, you are only decrypting a very small symmetric key only, not the entire data. So that is how practically the cryptography is used. So the key exchange happens over a symmetric key. And uh, the data gets in, uh, encryption will happen over through the symmetric key encryption. So any questions on whether it is a symmetric key or a symmetric key? Okay. So I think everybody understood uh, what is a symmetric key and what is an asymmetric key. Moving on. So let's try to understand the asymmetric key encryption. There are block ciphers and stream ciphers. So what is this means block ciphers and stream ciphers? For example, uh, our message was 1, 2, 3, 4, correct? If I took two characters as a block and then I convert that into encryption, that is I give this encryption algorithm an input 1, 2 as an input, then the output will be A, B, correct? And then I will give the input 3, 4, the output will be C, D. So you are processing the input as a block by block. Okay. The smaller the block is, the longer time it takes for the encryption. Obviously, for example, uh, you, you take uh, one minute to convert uh, one block of uh, cipher, uh, plain text to cipher text is one minute. And if your block size is two character at a time, then you are taking two minutes. But if your block size is one character at a time, you will take four minutes because first you have to convert one to A, two to th B, three to C and four to D, right? So your block size matters as well. That is because you are taking one block at a time. What is stream cipher? It will take each character as an input and process and give an output as a stream. Then it becomes a stream or cipher. So block ciphers and stream ciphers. The good example is we have data encryption standard DES and advanced encryption standard AES. So if you see any encryption, it can it needs two main things. One is algorithm, one is key. So how did we convert one, two, three, four to ABCD? For example, the algorithm was each input or each numeric will represent one letter in the English alphabet and first letter of the English alphabet. That is one will become A, two will become B, three will become C, four will become D because that is your key. Key is one. So one equal to one. So one will become A, two will become B, three will become C, four will become D. That is the algorithm and key is one. Now algorithm remains same and key becomes two. What will happen? One, two, three, four input will become B, C, D, E instead of A, B, C, D because the key is altered. Correct. So based on the algorithm and the key, 
and the length of the message that you are trying to alter the performance will vary okay so data encryption standard will have basically will have a 64 bit block size okay that is uh, so this is something uh, for you to find out to just understand the concept the application of this concept will come in the next phase okay so 64 bit block size it will take it's a block cipher so it will take 64 bits as a block and it will convert into a, uh, basically uh, it it ha it used to have a 128 bit uh, character length as a key and it will convert it as a encryption standard or an encrypted message okay now what happened was for example uh, the whole algorithm is always uh, available in the internet okay so the whole strength of your algorithm lies on the key size that you use if your key is weak then your algorithm will become uh, compromised okay because whenever you are uh, uh, taking uh, uh, this as a when you are whenever you are considering any encryption you always should think that um, algorithm is available to the hacker the strength of the your encryption lies in the key size only okay so that is why it is very important for you to uh, ensure the key length is what matters okay uh, so since the algorithm was available with the amount of computers computational power that was available the desk became compromised that is uh, you will be able to reverse uh, identify the key because you give some input you get some output right but you don't know the key but as you keep giving some inputs and outputs and you reverse calculate how that uh, from what output was coming from what input you will be able to understand the key for example 1 2 3 4 i gave i got a b c d as output now i gave 5 6 7 8 as an input i am getting e f g h so i keep giving like that three four times then i know that okay this is how the key is calculated so even though key was not known it was brute force that way so what they have done is okay since that is becoming uh, 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 you know the key is becoming easy because you are getting an output in one transformation of algorithm they call it triple des that is 3 des triple des so what basically it does is instead of using one key and uh, same algorithm once it will use three different keys and before you get one input and a as an output it would have transformed three times the same input for example uh, after putting a key length of one the first output was a and then that a is fed again to the same algorithm and again it will use a different key then some output would come let's say p as some c again this c is fed to the same algorithm again on a different key and then finally you get an output then the final output will be some x or y from for 1 to x because then you will not be able to reverse engineer and find out the key and then get the encryption uh, decryption message from the encrypted message so that is how they have overcome the limitation of this now aes advanced encryption standard um, it uses 128 bit as a block cipher each block so obviously it is faster because it is using a bigger block and it gives you various key lengths you can use 64 128 256 it has the capacity to use various key lengths okay so this is how the data encryption standard or advanced encryption standard basically works at a very high level now let's try to understand what is public key encryption so what we understood now is the symmetric key right so asymmetric key encryption is what is used as a public key encryption so what it means is the message that you use to encrypt and decrypt the key that you use to encrypt and decrypt should be different right because in the previous cases we are using the same key to encrypt and same key to decrypt that's why you are trying to rely on the strength of the key because if the keys gets compromised the message gets released but in public key encryption what would happen is you will have a different input and different output i mean uh, you will have a different key to encrypt and different key to decrypt so what will happen is you will have some somebody called certification agent ca between person a and person b they will generate a public key and private key for you okay so what will happen is the public key and private key private key is only with the user public key is available for anybody so if person a wants to send a message to person b 
what he will do is person b's public key is available to everybody right so what he can do he can encrypt the message with the public key of person b and send it to person b and only person b will have the private key of it to decrypt the message and read it so what happened the 1 2 3 4 message that i want to send from person a to person b i use person b's public key that is available to everybody so i will encrypt the message using the public key and then i send it to person b since person b is the only person who can decrypt it can decrypt the message and read it so what kind of principle of caa triad is now uphold by this way of sharing message using person b's public key and encrypting and then person b is can only have the capability to decrypt so what what is maintained here can anybody else also try data integrity okay that's interesting everyone going for integrity anybody else want to give a try confidentiality and integrity okay confidentiality okay reliability hmm that's not the part of caa triad sorry integrity okay those of you who are answering integrity let's see. i unfortunately differ with you so it is the popular uh, popular uh, reply the reason is if it is integrity has maintained what does integrity means the data should not be altered when the message is reaching from person a to person b then we call the data is integral correct everybody agree with me yes okay great but don't you think the public key that you have used to encrypt a particular message is available to everybody so what will happen you are supposed to send the word 1 2 3 4 but i am the hacker in between what i will do i will add 5 6 7 8 also i will use the same public key encryption and i will add that 5 6 7 8 encrypted word encrypted uh, message and then i will send it to the person b along with your 1 2 3 4 so when person b decrypts it he will read 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 because the public key was available with everybody so the integrity of message is altered but as a hacker what you could not do is you would not be able to understand that the message that was intended 1 2 3 4 you will not be able to know because the private key was only available with the recipient so you didn't know that 1 2 3 4 was sent but you added your own random characters to it and sent it you all agree so the integrity was not maintained but the confidentiality was maintained because hacker couldn't read 1 2 3 4 but the message was altered by the time it reached the person b okay so how can you think we can come across this problem is now what person a does is so when person b receives he want to ensure to maintain the integrity of the message he should ensure that the message was coming from person a only without being altered yes it was there was, yes we could we will we are not able to rely on that message except confidentiality so what we need to do now is we want to add confidential along with it integrity also now how we, how we will call it integrity when i know the message is coming from person a only and the message is not altered in between then i know that the message is correct correct so i want to put a wrapper around the public key encryption so what what i what i basically do is first i will encrypt using person b's public key no no not uh, not yet hash we we still have time to go till there okay so what i do is first i will do is i will basically uh, use the public key of person b and i get a encrypted message so 1 2 3 4 is encrypted but 
I don't want anyone to uh, when person B receives. I don't. I want him to know that only this part of the data was sent by me. If anybody is adding anything else, discard. Correct. So I want to put some stamp. So what is my stamp? My stamp is my private key. Person A's private key. If I encrypt that encrypted message again, then what will happen? So just to explain you again, right? Our whole intent is to don't lose me again. Okay, I'll I'll go slow, but please pay attention. Okay, because um, you again otherwise you lose color. Just pay attention. Our whole purpose is to send this one, two, three, four this message from person A to person B, and when person B receives this message. he should be able to prove two things that the message that is received is not altered in between and the message is coming from person a only as long as these two are taken care then i know that person b can trust that data okay to do that what we have to do the first part of it is to ensure confidentiality i have to what this 1 2 3 message has to be encrypted with public key of Uh, the person b because once i do that encryption whatever the output of that is that 1 2 3 4 let's say now converted into abcd this abcd will go back to 1 2 3 4 only if you know the private key of b correct so that means we have ensured encryption okay confidentiality is maintained great but as i said in the previous attack case i have added 5 6 7 8 8. so that is a problem so you want to avoid that problem you want to ensure you know exactly the length of the message that i am receiving from a person a only so what i can do is i will ask that person a put your private key sign sign this 1 2 3 4 message with your private key and then send it across so that when person b receives that message first he will use the public key to decrypt and then again use his private key to decrypt that message again in that way what i have ensured the message that i have received is only from person a because only person a knows his private key correct so that a B, so what is the first level of encryption happened was 1 2 3 4 uh if you you guys followed me you understood or if you didn't understand i'll try to put it onto note pad yes public key to decrypt yes uh we don't use diagrams here but let me put it into a notepad uh one second let me stop sharing this and let's use a notepad let me see uh, if i can share my screen with notepad and then let's discuss it on the notepad okay so how do we generally put public key is this way let's say public key this way private key of a similarly we have public key of b and public key of sorry private key of b so what do i need to do first my message is 1 2 3 4 this is my message so i will encrypt this message with public key so we call it actually pu sorry for that public key so public key of b so now what this basically does is this message can only be read with private key of b correct so this will ensure the message is safe whatever i am sending this 1 2 3 4 cannot be read at all but i also want to ensure the message is coming from only a so what i will do this message again i will encrypt with my private key
this entire message is encrypted with my private key so now if i send this message to person b what person b has to do he has to use my public key that is available to decrypt this entire message this will ensure basically that the data that is coming is only from a because if someone else alters when you put the public key of a whatever the additional things that got added let's say 5678 is somebody trying to add this will not get decrypted so i am ensuring that only the data is coming from a by signing this with my private key and then i extract the data of this out of it when i when i decrypt it this is what i would get this is what i would get correct then i have to decrypt this with my private key then the output should be 1 2 3 any confusions or you guys understood this concept now this is called public key cryptography so as you see basically as you see the amount of encryption and decryption is huge here so this will have impact on performance this is exactly the reason why so this is the exactly the reason why we want to ensure that key exchange happens like this securely no private keys are not shared private key means private not to not for anybody else so to decrypt i just need to know his public key so whatever is encrypted with the public key can be decrypted with the private key whatever is encrypted with the private key can be decrypted with the public key okay so this is how we ensure but as you see there are more encryptions and decryptions than just simple one one step encryption and decryption so that is why key exchange happens like this and once key is safely exchanged between two parties then you use the symmetric key encryption okay so this will also ensure what is what you can do basically is for the same message what now i'll tell you what is digital signature simply so what is digital signature means the message that you are trying to send across is ensuring public keys how public keys are exchanged public keys are available with a something called ca certified agents certification agents so these are publicly available certification agents so you can go and uh, check the public available keys of uh, anybody with them or uh, we also have called key access brokers casb key access brokers so they will contain these keys so any publicly available keys can be downloaded from there okay so what is a digital signature one good example digital signature is used in your day to day lives is your form 16 the form 16 that you receive we are in june month so you must be already receiving form 16s so the form 16s that you use basically will be uh are digitally signed by your cfo or your finance chief financial officers or finance team right so that you know that the form 16 you are receiving is authenticated so how do you prove authentication right so the authentication is means that digital signatures expectation is to prove a, a, a something called non repudiation so what is non repudiation means basically non repudiation means you cannot deny that i was not the person who has done that activity okay so a person a tomorrow should not say that i was not the person who sent this 1 2 3 4 here he cannot say that because he signed this with his private key if you see he signed it with his private key 
this one this entire message was signed by his private key and private key was only available to that person in that case he cannot say oh i i was not the person who has done it correct so that is what is nothing but putting your digital signature in place what is known only to you you have put that message there okay so what they what they basically do is to ensure if you don't want confidentiality okay but so this that is what digital signature now you understood that you understood what is non repudiation means non repudiation means your digital signature provides non repudiation okay but not every case you want to encrypt there are cases where you don't want to encrypt but you want to ensure the data reached is correct that is i am sending from a 1 2 3 4 i don't mind anybody reading it but when person b receives 1 2 3 4 he should be able to guarantee that ha ah, okay what i received is not altered in between in that case what we use is hashing that we learned in password we learned what is pass in hashing right so hashing is a technique is a one way encryption that is for or we call it message digest message digest so what it basically does is along with 1 2 3 4 it will compute it will use some algorithm and it will say your hash of this is uh let's say l so after person b receives this 1 2 3 4 if he recalculates 1 2 3 4 hash the value should come back as l instead of l let's say the message was altered to 5 and he computes a hash and then the output will never be l then the output always be x the algorithm the key that you use for two different texts of input the output will never be same that is the case we call hashing so hashing will ensure that basically hashing will ensure that your message is not altered in between so it is only providing the integrity not confidentiality so what you need to understand as a security person is in different scenarios what property you want to uphold what will provide that property so if you want uphold only the integrity then hashing is enough if you want to use uh, combination of these then digital signature can be a good combination where you are putting hashing and also then put encryption then what would happen it will never be you will you will always be ensuring that the data that you doing is safe enough correct so these are the various things that are concepts in cryptography again i understand you are listening it for the first time not many of you had the chance to go through and read the documentation so in the next session probably first 10 minutes we will give it back to the cryptography so you read it you have more questions we come back and then we discuss again make sense guys so we are, let me give you a couple of examples what happened how some of these people have used this uh, attacks in successful before right on april 12th 11th what happened is basically uh, there's a company called barakuda networks and uh, there was an application firewall and uh, it had a sql injection vulnerability so in the they used a programming language called php and in that they found the sql injection vulnerability and they have breached through it so this is how uh, that exact url was looking in the php script so barakuda networks.com/customers verticals php and then they had this v parameter v vulnerability and then they found it and then they sneaked through and then they brought the website down so this was one of the good examples that i see or uh, in the uh, Uh, SQL injection that was used. Yes, uh, this is the Barakuda Networks. Oops, sorry. B A R R A. B A R R A C U D A. Yeah, not single spelled with double R. Barakuda. Yeah. Barakuda Networks. dot com. So this was one example where the SQL injection was successfully used. And then there was something called Sami Worm. So Sami Worm was again a cross site injection. As we saw, we can just um, cross site injections uh, we can even do a non harming one as well right where uh, you can just make a display come out so this guy wanted just uh, basically uh, his name to be famous uh, so he just used that vulnerability and uh, then they used this that most of all sammy is my hero so this uh, this message started appearing every time uh, you know anybody's uh, script cross site scripting got attacked 
you know attack and uh, then it was using and uh, then the fastest it was became the fastest spreading virus because it was cross site scripting one one website leading to the other website to the other website uh, so what was it used was this uh, the div styles technical details so they use the so those of you who are using familiar with javascript would know that the div styles are used uh, basically to uh, do the website scripting uh, one of the style sheeting uh, this thing uh, style sheeting uh, ports and uh, then they used uh, this was this as an example where they have used uh, exploited the vulnerability there Uh, people use they they not every Java. You can allow Java plugins uh, if you want to. In the in the settings, you can go and uh, use it. So this was an old attack, uh, but it's still used. So to give you a perspective, uh, before we jump on to questions today, you would have noticed in all uh, papers and it was all out there very phonetically about um, a new malware uh, called uh, Silex malware. So this is something that is targeting all the IoT machines, and uh, this um, this is something if you can try go and look into it today. S I L E X Silex malware. So this is the new malware that is spreading and attacking all IoT devices. If you have smartphones, smart TVs, and you have not changed those default passwords, basically what it does is uh, it uses the brute force attack uh, because those are the default passwords people are generally using. Once it gains access to the root access, because I don't know if anybody, if they are uh, not changing the Gmail passwords, I highly doubt a smart TV owner is changing the smart TV passwords. So both the default passwords you use, you just bring it from the TV and use it. Uh, those uh, default passwords it, he uses. And once he gains the root access, basically what he does is that uh, he will go and uh, uh, delete your uh, uh, all network connections. He will drop the network connection tables, routing tables, so it basically, uh, and your all admin access to it. And yes, Silex malware. And then what it will do is basically then your device becomes useless because uh, it cannot connect anymore. It will become a dead brick. But in case you get attacked, what you can do basically is install the firmware, then it will, your TV starts or your IoT starts working. Because once you reinstall the firmware, all those tables by, by default will come back. Basically, it is dropping the table. It is very simple because it was a 14-year-old kid who has created this malware. Uh, once it gains the access, it is just executing simple commands to drop all the tables. So, But if you reinstall the firmware, everything will come back. So in case you fall susceptible to that attack, hopefully you are not. But if you do or if any of your smart TVs, just go find the malware, uh, I mean, uh, the firmware version that is available and download the firmware and then it should take care. But uh, if you have not yet done it, please go ahead and change your uh, TV, smart TV passwords. So that, have a great day. Bye.